One of the reasons we are so desperately weak today is the fact that history has been covered up. Books have been rewritten, and it only takes about two generations for everything to be forgotten, especially if it is not told over and over again. Most Christians know nothing of their heritage and the terrible price that was paid by those before us who stood against the Roman Catholic system. Many of our young people have no concept of what an Inquisition is. It is when a religious force moves in with such power, deception, and cruelty that it destroys everything standing in its way. The Christians of today are like little blades of grass growing up in the sunshine and there's a big lawnmower coming towards them and it's singing hymns. Here are the New World Order kingdoms that Daniel foresaw, and in the last days he saw that the Roman Empire would rule the earth up until the time that the kingdom of God comes back and destroys the Roman Empire. That's why we are focusing so much time and effort on what the scriptures, the word of God tells us to focus on, and that is the Roman Empire. Then we'll be able to see who is in control of the world. Now we're going to get into Daniel's prophecy. And he foresaw Babylon, uh, the New World Order of Babylon. Then when it fell, the Medes and Persians took over. And when that kingdom fell, Greek under Alexander the Great. And when that empire fell, Rome rose. And it would not fall until the kingdom of God would destroy it. And he said Rome it was powerful at one time in history. It ruled the world. And then it split into legs of iron. I want you to remember that word of iron because we're going to get into it more and more. And as you see, uh, the New World Order Rome heals, and as we're seeing, is the formation of a New World Order. As we look at the other leg of Nebuchadnezzar's prophecy in J Daniel chapter 7, he sees the lion, which represents England, and then England had wings and it flew to the United States. And it is called the Great Babylon today in Revelations 18. And as you see, the bear is Russia. And it will go to war with the United States and will nuke us, America. And the merchants of the earth will cry, who is able to buy our goods? Because America is no longer, uh, Revelations 18 goes on to say. So it clearly identifies America as the Great uh, Babylon today. And out of this war... As we're seeing now, the European Union is being healed, and uh, everything is coming together after this next war and will form an Antichrist New World Order. Now we're going to get into the history of the Roman Empire and explain to you why you can't make this connection unless you know the history behind the scriptures. And once you get that point, then things are very clear. This is Constantine the Great. His father is the one who ruled the Roman Empire at the time. And when his father died, uh, the power became a power struggle between him and this man right here, Maxentius. And they have fought, like throughout the history of Rome, to be the next emperor. And uh, here you see a picture of both of them together. And it was the battle for the next emperor of Rome. This is a mural, a painting inside the Vatican depicting the battle between Constantine the Great and Maxentius. And as you see here, Constantine, uh, before the great battle, foresaw in a vision that he would win the battle. And, and so he did. And this is what started the Roman Catholic Church. This uh, Constantine the Great won the battle against Mac Maxentius. And this was the part of history we need to really understand to bring it together. Thus, after Constantine the Great won his victory battle, he was the first emperor to drop paganism, religion, 
which all emperors had, was they were all pagans. He even says in the encyclopedia that Constantine was a pagan. And so after he saw this so-called vision that he says started the new Catholic Church. And thus, not only was he the new emperor of Rome, but now he was also the Pope, or what they call both the first papal Caesar. In 337 AD, as his life, Constantine's life was slipping away, Constantine was laid out in his royal robes and publicly baptized. He had refused to be baptized all his life, and it is suspected that by the time the water hit his forehead, he was already a corpse. Immediately after, his senators and troops and all submitted to baptism. It was a movement or of triumph for the Roman Catholic system. And also to be noted, this was the, the beginning of the Dark Ages. It was a terrible time to live during the Dark Ages, called the First Reich. It was the monarchy rule of the Catholic Church. If you went against Caesar or you went against the Church, you were forbidden to read and have scriptures of your own. If you were caught with scripture, you were executed upside down. Let's briefly review the history. The Dark Ages, called the First Reich, was the monarchy rule of the Catholic Church. Then trouble happened. The printing press was invented in 1450. It was hard to control the Bible from being printed. More trouble in 1517. Martin Luther exposed the, de the, the uh, deceptions of the Roman Catholic Church by his 95 Thesis, The Bible versus the Church. This started the apostate movement called the Protestants. This created the army of the Pope, the Society of Jesus, known as the Jesuits, was formed to counter the apostates in 1540. The Reich War of the Holy Roman Empire continues today. Here we see that Daniel's prophecy came true, as he predicted. In 395 AD, the Roman Empire splits in both the West and the East. And as you see here in the West, you got the Roman Empire, which the official language is in Latin, and the official language in Byzantine is Greek. And if you look at the American law books today, you'll see that both Latin and Greek are both in our laws. You notice that the Roman numeral is in the Super Bowl. You notice that the pharmaceutical companies and all the pharmaceutical goods are in Latin. It's very interesting to note those things. As Daniel prophesied, the Western Roman kingdom is more greedier than the Byzantine Eastern uh, Empire. And as you see here, the Holy Roman Empire is uh, also called the Kingdom of Germany. There's a map of the 12th century. Well, this is the First Reich. This is a, a time period for 844 years the Holy Roman Catholic Empire that Constantine set up was had an attempt to revive the old Roman Empire. It was called the Dark Ages. The Holy Roman Catholic Crusades took place and the Knights Templar. After the, the First Reich, for 844 years, the Roman Empire tried to reestablish their strength again in the Second Reich, which lasted the 47 years the German Empire, and Germany was defeated in World War I in 1918, and the uh, Roman Empire collapsed. And the Third Reich, which we will get into some depth at, uh, soon, lasted 12 years, and that was Hitler's Nazi Empire with the uh, Roman Catholic Church. And now they're trying to set up the Fourth Reich, so now they can set up their One World Order. This newspaper article is out of the Independent UK News, and it's dated March 12, 2003. And as we read down the article, listen to this. It goes on to say, To the Rome Treaty, which created the ICC. 
And what are they talking about? What is the ICC? The ICC is the International Criminal Court. So what Daniel saw is coming true. The Roman Empire is setting up the International Criminal Court under the Roman Treaty. Here we see the Pope calling for a new world order. This is out of CNN. CNN.com, Pope calls for a new world order, January 1st, 2004. And why is he... Why is the Pope calling for a new world order? In the article he says, he stressed that to bring about peace, there needs to be a new respect for international law and the creation of a new international order based on the goals of the United Nations. So that's why we have to have the international court system so everything is under one monarchy rule like in the past. On MSNBC.com, April 2nd, 2004, the article goes on to say, Al-Qaeda suspects, suspect urges Rome's destruction. And it says, Rome is a cross, the West is a cross, and Romans are the owners of the cross. Apparently, when people know their history, they understand that Rome is the owners of the West, the Americans. In the same article, Al-Qaeda goes on to say, the Vatican could be a potential target. Rome is a cross. The West is a cross, and the Romans are the owners of the cross. Muslims' target is the West, and we will split Rome open. And here, it's right in front of us, people. We need to realize, once you understand history, the news just comes right out and tells us who is behind it all. This is a news article out of New York Times magazine on June 13, 2004, and the headline of it says, Bush asked for Vatican's help on political issues. Who's in control of who? Here you see George W. Bush. This is the true enemy, is these five-foot statues on both sides they are called fasci, and they're a bundle of reeds with an axe portrayed in the center of it. Now let's look and see what the dictionary has to say. This is what the Webster Dictionary says about the fasci. It's a bundle of rods, and among them an axe with projecting blade born before ancient Rome magistrates has a badge of authority. So see, people, that what you see in Congress right behind President Bush is the symbols of Rome's authority. That's what these are right here. It's not Al-Qaeda, not CIA, but it is Rome fascism to bring in the New World Order. Here you see the, the, the seal of Colorado, and right there is the Roman fasci, right on the Colorado seal. As you see, this is the United States Senate, and here you have the cross of the fasci right on the logo of the United States Senate. Of course, you got the Knights of Columbus uh, organization out of the Catholic monarchy, the fasci. And here you see the fasci and the European Union passport right there. Of course, here's the fasci right here, the United States Congress, and this is the mace, and we'll get into that, what the mace stands for. That's also the Roman mace along with the Roman fasci. Here are the old Roman coins. Uh, you can see the fasci on the coin depicted here. And even on the United States dime, the old mercury dime, on the back of it is the Roman fasci, showing you it's the badge of authority, just like Daniel predicted in the scriptures. Here's a stamp with Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, Mussolini on there, and here you have the Roman fasci on one aspect of it, and the mace, the Roman mace, which we will cover here shortly. This is the United States, inside the U.S. chambers of the house, is the mace, the Roman mace of, of a badge of authority. Here you see the Italian stamp, and what she's holding here is also the fasci. 
This is the official uh, website of the ushouse.gov, and you can read about the fascists and the Roman fascists all through their website that were under the control of Rome. And here in the same website says the mace used to restore order. And here you see a congressman or somebody, the sergeant of arms actually, can walk over to uh, the congress who's out of order and set them back into order using the Roman mace. And you can read this out of the, the house.gov. This is when the Pope got shot back in 81. And here you see the gunman, and he shoots the Pope in the stomach. And uh, this is what the Muslim had to say. Here's the Muslim here who shot the Pope, and this is what he had to say. This is out of CNN. And he says, The Vatican prelates helped him carry out the 1981 attack. Without the help of the priests and cardinals, I would have not been able to carry out that action. The devil is within the Vatican. For those that want to find this article, read up on it. It's CNN, Thursday. March 31st, 2005, you can read it for yourself. It was an inside job to make the Muslims look bad so everybody has sympathy for the white pope. Here's John Paul II, the pope, with the Trilateral Commission, April 18th, 1983. Here's the pope with Queen Elizabeth. And here's John Paul with the Jewish Masonic Lodge. March 22nd, 1984. While we're on the subject, well, let's see who's behind Freemasonry. This book, this book called The Relationship of Mormonism and Freemasonry was written by President Anthony Ivins in the First Presidency of the LDS Church. As we open the page, this book is signed January 1936. The Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints to an elder on his mission. And as you see here, it's signed by Heber J. Grant, J. Reuben Clark, and David O. McKay. This is the apostle of the LDS Church who wrote the book. And over here it says, A Relationship of Mormonism and Freemasonry. The book was copyrighted in 1934. And it's printed in in the USA by the Deseret News Printing Press. This book is heavily researched about the history of Freemasonry, and these are the sources of where they got their information. It says the history of Freemasonry, and it goes on. They also got their information, uh, the morals and dogma of the accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry published by the authority of the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree for the Southern Jurisdiction of the United States. Also, the book has the history of Grand Lodge of Iowa and also the history of the Grand Lodge of Illinois' free, ancient free and accepted masonry. So you notice that this book is very heavily researched. As you see on page 16, it talks about the history of Freemasonry. And on page 17, this is what it says, the roots of Freemasonry comes from. Freemasonry had its origins with the Knights Templar. Between the date of its inception at Jerusalem, 1118-1314, the Order of the Knights Templars had become a powerful and wealthy organization. They recognized allegiance to no power above that above the church, of which the Pope was the recognized head. So right here we see that the origins came from the Freemasonry, came from the Knights Templar, which their allegiance was the Pope. So Masonry comes down from the Pope. Here's a photograph of George Bush and John Kerry sitting outside the Skull and Bones Crypt at Yale University in 1966. And this is what they did inside the crypt. Inside the Skull and Bones. The highlight of the year of the Skull and Bones celebration inside the crypt at Yale University was called the Bacchus Celebration when the Skull and Bones members dressed as the devil, the Pope, and other creepy characters, and the group would chant, The hangman equals death, 
the devil equals death, death equals death. So obviously, they must believe in the devil because they chant the devil equals death, and they also say that the, the devil uh, dress as the Pope. This is an interesting side note that the population in 2003 at Vatican City, which is the smallest country in the world, just happens to be 9-11. This is Vatican City, just happens to be the smallest state in the world. And what did John the Revelator say about the smallest city in the world? And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Talk about worshiping the beast that John Revelator just prophesied. But here you see in the newspaper article, the, the presidents pay their respects to the beast. And there you got Clinton, Clinton here, Bush Sr., Bush, Bush Jr.'s wife, and the president. And the president pays their respect to the beast. And there they all are. They look pretty sad, don't they? Their master is gone. Who's ruling who? Here is St. Petersburg Square, and here you see the obelisk that the Vatican stole from Egypt. In fact, they stole all 13 of these obelisks that represents the sun god, Baal. And, uh, they, they, in fact, Rome has more obelisks, 13, than anywhere else in the world. And as we pan back here, we'll see that there's little, looks like the spokes of a Roman wheel. And it's interesting, remember the old quote that says, All roads lead to Rome. In the middle of St. Peter's Square is the obelisk, or axle, to the Roman wheel. This all roads or power leads to the Vatican. And here you go. You can see the uh, kind of the Roman wheel spokes right here on the outside. And this represents the sun god, and we'll get into this symbol right here. Even on our gold and silver coins, you see the symbols of the two empires, Greek and Rome. And here you see the, the, the Greek and uh, on, on our coins. So we got the Greek and, and Rome displayed on our monies. Here's a poster of the European Union, and it says here, Many Tongues, One Voice, and you can see that the Tower of Babel is under construction. And uh, I'll show you what these stars here, they're inverted. Here you see the goat head representing the stars. It's, it's stars that are inverted. And right here, the goat head represents, in Matthew 25, 33, the Lord says, the sheep on my right hand and the goats on my left. And so you can see where this is a satanic symbol, and they display it right on the European Union's own poster, depicting the old painting of the Tower of Babel being crumbled here in the 16th century. So they're rebuilding it. Here's a photograph of the European Union's Parliament building built in December 2000, and look, it looks just like their, their Tower of Babel under construction. And this is the Euro coin, and on the $2 Euro coin, you see the woman riding the beast. And this is what it says in Revelation 17. Revelation 17:7, 7, it goes on to say, and the woman and the beast that carrieth her. And look at prophecy being fulfilled by them sticking that uh, scripture right on the euro coin. Isn't that amazing? Who is really behind all this? The European Union building the Tower of Babel Lincoln under construction and the Parliament building here of the European Union as it looks just like the Tower of Babel under construction. There's the original coin, the European Union coin, and there's the scripture. It says, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her. And right above it is the original poster of the European Union. And as it says, it says, Many tongues, one voice, the Council of Europe. And here we see 
them building the Tower of Babel. And there's the inverted stars. As you see there. And right off to the left there you see the uh, the blockheads right there. And right there you see two men hugging each other. Symbol of uh, homosexual activity. And right over here they're all blockheads except for that little baby. Little baby there has a round head. So it hasn't been indoctrinated yet. It hasn't gone to indoctrinated school so it could become like the rest of the blockheads. So it's very interesting symbolism as you look around. And here you see it's all spiritual warfare. People, you need to wake up. This is the European Union poster. And there's the inverted stars. Represents the goats on the left hand. Here's the famous painting of the Tower of Babel. It's in Vienna. And right here you can see this is where they got their, their painting from. Got the people over there. It's all under, all torn apart. 16th century famous painting of the Tower of Babel by, by the artist. And it's displayed in the Museum in Vienna. Now we're going to get into the worship, the worship of Baal, which is the worship of the sun. And here you see the old images of the people worshiping the, the sun, S-U-N, instead of the S-O-N. And what does the Lord think? Let's see what the Lord God has to say about worshiping the sun. Read Ezekiel 8, 16 through 17. And the scripture goes on to say that there were 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they worship the sun towards the east. And he says that they commit the abominations, and they provoke me to anger. So the Lord gets very, very upset when you worship the S-U-N instead of his true son, S-O-N. This picture symbolizes the real power behind the European Union. What you are looking at is the official European Union Union's website. You can go here yourself and check it out. Get a nice little close-up with the web address. And here you see this was signed on October 29, 2004. And that is Pope Innocent number 10. And now I'll scroll down the web page and you can see for yourself who is the, the real power behind Rome. There's Tony Blair signing the European Union Constitution right here. And there's the real power behind Rome. Unbelievable. Just got to look for yourself. They're behind the First Reich, the Second Reich, the Third Reich, and now they're setting up their empire into the Fourth Reich, and there's Pope Innocent number 10, right there. And there's Tony Blair. And this is the official website of the European Union. They just throw it in your face, but because we don't know our history, through our ignorance, we are destroyed, the Lord says. As you see, there's a triple crown on the Pope. You see there's one, two, three crowns. And the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church says that the Pope rules over heaven, earth, and hell. That's what the triple crown stands for. Here's some of the news articles. This one's out of BBC News, Sunday, 29th June, 2003. It says, Pope John Paul II has urged the European Union to include a recognition of Europeans' Christian heritage. So they wanted to rediscover their Christian roots, which is the old Dark Ages. So here the Pope's pressing the EU on those issues. 
The next, this is out of, here's another article out of the European Union Business, the 10th month, 19th day, 2003, and the headline reads, The Vatican tells Turkey not to rush into European Union's membership. Who is the Vatican to tell what countries can or cannot join the European Union? Obviously, this is a very revealing article telling that the Vatican tells who can and cannot go into the European Union. This is a very revealing uh, photograph. Here you have Pope Innocent Number 10 in the background, and you have all the European Union's presidents uh, standing on both sides of the aisle like a soldier would under command. Who is that powerful that they would line up and have the Pope Innocent Number 10 in the background obviously given orders? Very revealing picture. Well, this is where the Treaty of Rome originated on March 25, 1957. This is where the Treaty of Rome was drafted up. It was drafted up in the exact same room. As you can see right here is Pope Innocent Number 10 with his arms stretched in the background. So it's drafted in the same room where they signed the European Union's Constitution in 2004 October. Very revealing who's behind all this. On the other side of the room, you got Pope Innocent Number 10 over here, and on the other side of this room, on the other end of the room, is a similar marble statue of Innocent 10's predecessor, Pope Urban VIII, right here. So you got popes on both sides of the, uh, the Treaty of Rome room where they signed the European Union Constitution. If you go to the European Union's website that I just showed you, it says in the article that this hall is the political and religious center of ancient Rome. So they're telling you that they're mixing the, the Caesar's Roman Empire and the religious, which is the Holy Roman Empire, together to, to an, an ancient Rome into one new world order. Here's another photograph of the triple crown on his head that represents heaven, earth, and hell. This is an example how the Pope believes that he rules over heaven, earth, and hell. This is out of the Associated Press. And John, uh, John Paul wants to be a, become a saint, and he can't become a saint until the Pope makes him a saint. So the Pope sets himself above God. He's the one that makes, can make you a saint, not the Lord. After the signing of the European Union Constitution of 2004, October 29th, here you have all the European Union leaders standing outside. And what do we got here in the corner? This is the statue of Constantine, the, one, the first pope and, and emperor of Rome, the one who started the Holy Roman Empire. There's his arm and there's his head. This is revealing to know who is behind the Holy... This is basically the Fourth Reich. You are seeing the New World Order come into being. Oh, it's shocking. Here's another picture inside that same building, the home of, of Rome City Hall where all this took place. And there's Constantine again, melting together the Holy Roman Empire and the New World Order. Here's another display of Rome, of the two children that started Rome. I think it's Romus and Ramus. Anyway, they're sucking the tits of the wolf. These are the member states here that signed the European Union Constitution on the 29th of October. And you can see here you got the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and all of the other countries that are involved. Countries, Canada, this one here says countries who will sign the final act only. And this one's countries participating as observers, Croatia. And this is right out of the official website of the European Union. And in fact, the European Union money doesn't take effect until two years after they signed this constitution. So European, the Great British, the, the United Kingdom, will have their money changed in 2006, October, is when things will start being implemented with Euro coin, Euro, Euro dollar. Listen to this. Listen to what former president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, said during his visit to London, March 23, 2000 referring to the European Union as the new European Soviet. If America is to retain its freedom and independence 
and not allow the EU Soviet example, we must make sure that Congress rejects both CAFTA and FTAA. Well, CAFTA has already passed, and maybe while you're watching this tape, FTAA has probably been passed. And uh, here we are, we're fulfilling prophecy. The wound is being healed, the Holy Roman Empire, like Daniel foresaw. And Revelation 17, 7 says, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her. And here you see, we'll take another close-up. Here's the, the woman and the beast that carrieth her on the euro coin. And the woman is the religious system, the church. And the beast is the political system, the government. So we're here we have... We have a Catholic Church, and here we have the political uh, Roman system with their courts that we just went through, and uh, everything is tying together. Now this starts to make sense. And the woman, or the church, which thou sawest is that great city, the Vatican, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Scripture fulfilled. The great city is Vatican City. It's the only city in the world that, that is a monarchy that has the woman and, and the, the kings all subject to this great city. Revelation 17, 4 says, And the woman, the Catholic Church, was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, which happens to be the Vatican's official colors, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup, which is the Catholic Communion golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. That's Revelation 17, 4. Read it for yourself. This here is out of CNN, and it says, Pope visits the holy site of the Sermon on the Mount, and see on his background is the upside-down cross. And remember, they crucified all those who had Scripture or caught with Scripture. The Christians, they'd hang them upside down and crucify them. And here's an old painting right here of a Christian being crucified upside down for, being, for going against the will of the Pope. And if you read Revelations 13, 11, it says, And behold, another beast coming up, coming up out of the earth, and, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And look at that, two horns like a lamb. You just have to look at their hat sideways, and they throw it in your face. Looky here. Here's the pharaoh being carried in procession. As you see here, the pharaoh has a great big hat, and there's a big fan right here. The fan is not for keeping flies away. It was known as the mystic fan of Bacchus and was the symbol of pharaoh's authority. And as you look in this photograph here, you see the pope with his big hat, and he has two Bacchus fans of Pharaoh's authority, and he's being carried in procession, and here you see him being carried in procession, and here's the Pope, his big hat, and there's the Bacchus fan of uh, the Pharaoh's authority. And so here you see that they incorporate the older New World Order kingdoms into the next New World Order kingdom up. Getting back to the worship of the sun, which is Baal worship, we will show you a few things the Catholic Church is doing. Here you see the Pope carries the wafer inside the sunburst. And here you can get a closer view of the uh, sunburst there. And this is supposed to be the, the Jesus. And here it's represented by the S-U-N uh, instead of the S-O-N. Here you see the Pope wearing the little sons all over his uniform. Here you see on the on the Pope's sleeve the sun and here is the H I H S inside the sun, sun symbol and it represents the pagan Egyptian chief deities Isis, Horus and Seb. And so here you can see that they're incorporating the New World Order Kingdom, Egypt, into their uniform. Here you see the sun, the sun, S-U-N, image over St. Peter's tomb in St. Peter's 
basilica in the Vatican. And you can see how big it is. It just dwarfs every other idol inside St. Peter's Basilica. And there you go. Right below the sun's image is St. Peter's tomb, where supposedly his bones are laid in this coffin. Here are the symbols of the pagan sun. This is the obelisk, represents the sun god, worshiping the sun. And here within the wheel, you see the old uh, Baal, worshiping the sun symbols that are found in uh, Babylon, here and here. And you can see right in here, the same symbol of the wheel and the worship of the sun. And these two are found uh, at, the, at the University of Illinois, which is this one, and this one is found in the British Museum, the pagan sun god, the Baal worship that God forbids us to worship. And they put it right in the middle of St. Peter's uh, Square. Here you see the reverse side of a coin celebrating the pontiff John Paul II. And on it is the obelisk and the sun wheel. As you see, there's the obelisk and the sun wheel and the sun rays. There's another view of the sun god over St. Peter's uh, bones in his coffin. This is the tomb of Pope Gregory VIII. With, and you notice the dragon on his tomb. And if you read Revelations 12, 3, 4, and 9, chapter 12, it talks about, Behold, a, red, a, a great red dragon, and the dragon stood before the woman, and the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So here, the, the great dragon is represented by the devil. And he is responsible for the, our calendar that we use today. So what we use today is the Roman calendar, and he was the one who changed it, and it's famous. It's called the, Gre the Gregorian calendar. Here you see the coat of arms of one of the popes, and here you see the, the great red dragon, or the Lucifer is what the dragon represents in uh, Revelations chapter 12. This is a painting here inside the Vatican, and it's Constantine's visions of the cross. It was a pivotal movement in the conversion of pagan Rome to Christianity. The dragon that was painted as being a symbolic of ancient pagan Rome, right here. Now we're going to get into the true meaning of Christmas that Pope Gregory has on his calendar and how it all got started. And how did the Pope derive Christmas? Well, let's go back into history. The Queen of Babylon, the Semiramis, ordered the world to celebrate the birth of her son, Tammuz, of course, he was the sun god, Baal, representing Satan. She set December 25th for Baal's birthday. Her astrologers told her that the sun is at its furthest point from the earth during the winter solstice. So they, told, so they, were to, so they told the people that on the 21st of December, the sun, or Baal, dies. Then on the 24th of December, he starts coming back to life, and the 25th is his birthday. As time passed all over the world on the 25th of December, the sun was worshipped by these various names, Tammuz, Horus, Horus, Sol, etc. Smeramis ordered trees to be decorated with little balls representing the sun. God fought this evil holiday by forbidding the Jews to decorate trees as the heathens were doing. Jeremiah 10, 1 through 4. Read it for yourself. It's funny how we run out in the morning uh, as the sun is rising, as it's giving birth, coming up out of the east, how we run out under the tree and, and celebrate by opening our presents. 
And the Lord God says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This is the official Arlington Catholic Herald newspaper, the issue of 12-23-2004. And, the, and it, the, the question was, Was Christ really born on December 25th? Listen to what the article has to say. Their, their own Catholic newspaper. It says, The Roman pagans used to gather at the hill where the Vatican is presently located to commemorate the birth of the unconquered sun, S-U-N, this pagan feast. Continuing in the article, some historians credit Constantine, who declared Sunday as a day of rest in the empire, with, repl with replacing the pagan festival with that of Christmas. The article goes on to say, in practice, Christmas was celebrated in Rome by Pope Liberius in 352. Pope Gregory IV decided the date of Halloween in 835 AD. Halloween is the day before Catholic religion celebrates All Souls Day. All Souls Day was a day filled with prayer for the souls who died, for those in hell, the apostates who left the church, the Protestants. And the people banged on pots on Halloween to let the people in hell, the Protestants, know that they were not forgotten. The people started to dress up in costumes to express the dance of death for those who celebrated Halloween. They dressed up at night. Americans added trick or treating to Halloween. The Catholics had a plot to destroy Protestant King James I and the Parliament with gunpowder on November 5, 1605. Guy Fawkes was the guy in charge of the gunpowder, but he was captured and hung. This became a celebration in England known as the Guy Fawkes Day. They wore masks, visited Catholics, and demanded cake and beer, hence trick or treat. Martin... On October 31st, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis up on the wall to dispute the, the, the Catholic Church versus the Bible. This was the, the day that was called the Reformation Day. The Protestants celebrated this anniversary. And here the Catholic uses this celebration to celebrate witchcraft and Halloween. The 95 Thesis destroyed the Catholic Church as far as bringing out the scriptures, and the people started to read the scriptures and found out that the church was totally going the opposite direction than the scriptures, and the Pope was very upset. He says, this is an act of war. Get Luther. I want him dead. Now let's get into the, to what the, Rome, the Roman calendar has done to Easter. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, Easter was named after the pagan goddess of the Anglo-Saxons named Eastor, or the goddess of the dawn. It goes on to say, The greater abomination, are we really celebrating the resurrection of Christ, or Easter, the fertility goddess of Babylon? So you can see who is behind the calendar, who is behind these uh, holidays, these satanic holidays, to get us away from worshiping, the true sun, S-O-N, and worshiping the S-U-N, or Baal, or the goddess of Babylon. This is on the central entrance door of St. John's Lateran, the cathedral of the Bishop of Rome, or the Pope's official church in the Vatican. And it translates, the Supreme Mother of Churches. And there's only one church in the world that claims to be the supreme mother of churches, and that is the Vatican, fulfilling Revelation 17, 5. And it goes on to say, And upon her forehead was a name written, The Mother of Harlots, the Abominations of the Earth. So you could see that John was describing who is the, the mother of harlots. As you could see, here you can see the initials IHS on the Vatican's own coin. 
we really have to blow this up so you can see that IHS stands for the Egyptian deities, Isis, Horus, and Seb. And here you can see, we'll pan away so you can see the coin. And there is the Vatican's coin. This symbol in the yellow is the yin-yang. It's the symbol of the Roman Empire. It dates between the 4th and 5th centuries. Most people think it comes from China, but China links it back to the 12th century. So this insignia happens to be on the detachments of the infantry of the Western Roman Empire. And these are the different the, uh, symbolisms of their infantry. And you can see the yin-yang is one of them. Here you can see on the internet they're selling the yin and yang Roman glass earrings. Then you can see the Roman symbol at the Walmart stores, the yin-yang. And it basically means this. Well, everything has its yin and yang side. It means there is a little bad in the good and a little good in the bad, which would mean there is no absolute good or evil. And here you see a note of another photograph at Walmart showing the, the symbol of the Roman yin-yang. What you see here is the Iron Cross of Rome. And as you can see, the Pope wears the Iron Cross on his uniform. And right here is the Iron Cross with the Nazi SWAT sticker in the middle during Hitler's day. Remember what Daniel first saw? He saw the New World Order splits into legs of iron, and iron is used throughout the scriptures to, to link it with Rome. Here's another photograph of the Iron Cross of the Roman Empire, and as we pull away you can see that it's Adolf Hitler that wears the Iron Cross. In fact, if you look at all the photographs of Hitler, the only medal he wears on his church on his shirt is the iron cross over his heart. Here you also see the iron cross with also the skull and bones. There's also the iron cross on the Nazi flag. This is some history that the Vatican does not want you to know or your media or your schools. Hitler, born and raised a Catholic. On July 1st, 1933, the German government states that Hitler still belongs to the Catholic Church and has no intention of leaving it. You can look this up on the internet under the holocaustchronicles.com. And here you see Hitler signing an autograph with a Catholic nun. Here you see on Hitler's coins, there's the Nazi SWAT sticker, and here's the church. And in fact, Hitler was inaugurated in this church when he came into power. And it was also the same church where the Second Reich was born. And now this is the Third Reich. Some of these quotes I'm going to read you comes out of this book, The Holocaust Chronicles, and you can get it at any bookstore. These are, these are just some of the people that were involved in putting this book together. These are just some of the quotes here out of the book. In 1250, the papacy makes it clear to one and all that the Jews are stateless beings who depend on the kindness of the church for their very existence. And as you see here, there's a woman pleading for her life, a Jewish woman, and you can see the Catholic priest is sending her to her death. On April 26, 1933, Hitler claims that he is only doing to the Jews what the Catholic Church has already done to them for 1,600 years. On April 1943, the Pope Pius VII complains that the Jews are demanding and ungrateful. In this picture you see, you see the gypsy boys uh, were selected for cruel surgery to remove their penises and testicles. 
Hitler was keenly interested in sterilization of undesirables as a way to control unwanted population growth. How sick. May, in May 5, 1945, the presiding bishop of the Catholic, German Catholic Bishops' Conference instructs his priest to say a Mass in Hitler's memory. So here you are, the Catholics are celebrating Hitler. Okay, listen very carefully. The beginning of the Third Reich. On July 20th, 1933, the Vatican signs a concordant with Germany. Pope Pius XI considers the treaty as protecting Catholic rights in Germany. However, by this action, the Vatican helps legitimize the Third Reich in the eyes of the German Catholic hierarchy and laymen as well as of the international community. As a result, the Concordant helps pave the way for the Nazi totalitarianization of German society and later German attacks on the European state system. This is what the Third Reich is, people. It's a concordant or a contract between the Vatican and Germany. This is a very telling picture. Hitler greets Mueller, the Bishop of the Reich. And here he is. And you can see all the other puppets out there saluting the Roman salute to Hitler. And Hitler is meeting his Bishop of the Reich right here, Bishop Mueller. This is a photograph of Germany signing a concordant with the Vatican in Rome on July 20th, 1933. That started the Third Reich. By signing the concordant, Germany has now became a part of the government of God. The Vatican gives government divine protection and international protection. That's where the Third Reich started, right there. This is a photograph of the Catholics celebrating Hitler's birthday. It became an annual event for the Catholic Church and Hitler. This is a picture on April 20th, 1939. The celebrations became a tradition by Pope Pius XII. This is not the Hitler salute, it's the Roman salute. You can see it goes back to Rome and all you have to do is look in your encyclopedia and it explains that this salute right here is nothing but a Roman salute. Here you see the cab driver here giving the Roman salute to the Roman Catholic priest. Here's a Roman Catholic cardinal and how he, look how he marches in front of the soldiers and the Nazi soldiers here showing who's in command. This is a very telling picture here you have those who are saluting Hitler, and then you got the Roman Catholic priests standing there because they represent the government of God, and, he and they're here to give Hitler the orders from the Pope. The Iron Cross, to show you some of the history behind the Iron Cross, I just want to show you it derives from Rome just like Daniel said it would be. If you go back and read Daniel chapter 2, you notice that he refers to the Roman Empire as to iron. Iron equals the Roman Empire, and he mentions it eight different times in uh, verse 40 through 44. So let's take a look at this uh, Roman Iron Cross. Here's the Iron Cross of the Knights Templar back in the Dark Ages under the Holy Roman Empire. And as you see, this is decorated all over the place. Here's some more shots of the Iron Cross. It's no surprise that Hitler wore the Iron Cross because he was representing the Holy Roman Empire. This is also another uh, Crusader Knights Templar uh, during the Holy Roman Empire. As you can see, the Iron Cross. So that is the universal symbol of Rome. Right here you see the Iron Cross. That's in St. Peter 
Basilica in the Vatican. So you can see there's the the symbol of Rome and the Iron Cross. It just happens to be right there. Here's a closer shot of the Iron Cross. Here's the Iron Cross. There's the sun god Baal from Babylon worship. And there's St. Peter's tomb all in a row. Symbols of Rome and Babylon. Here you see all the soldiers swearing a personal loyalty oath to the Fuhrer. And this is the exact same three finger salute that is made to the Pope, the Swiss Guard. So you can see here that even the oath is uh, to the Fuhrer and to the Pope and to the Reich, the Third Reich salute. Here, here's, a here's the Swiss soldier swearing allegiance to the Pope. The Swiss soldiers served the armies of the Pope from the late 1300s onward. And now you know why Switzerland never gets invaded. Switzerland signed a concordant with the Pope to be their personal protectors. And in exchange, Switzerland holds the banking interest of the Vatican, holds all their gold and silver, and they are exempt from any country uh, to invade them. Now you know the real reason why Switzerland never gets invaded. This is a this is out of the Salt Lake Tribune, May 7, 2005. It says right below the picture here, A recruit raises three fingers during the swearing-in ceremony Friday of the Pope's elite military corps at the Vatican. They swear the loyalty to serve the Pope, sacrificing, if necessary, their life in his defense, the Swiss Guard. This is out of the Encyclopedia on Vatican City. It's the smallest independent country in the world, and it forms a territory of the Holy See, the central authority of Rome. And as you see on the back of your dollar bill, this familiar picture, and on the back, on this here, is actually the Holy See, is another name for the Pope and his territory. And there's only one country in the world where the official language is Latin, and, and we have Latin on the back of the dollar bill, and it translates announcing the birth of the New World Order. So when the, when the Holy See finally sits on its throne, the, the uh, Antichrist, three and a half years rule, uh, this, this top here will finally have a resting place once it's finalized when Rome's uh, wound is completely healed. For those of you Remember the Vatican's European Union poster, the official Euro European poster of the Tower of Babel being rebuilt? And if you look at your dollar bill, when the eye finally sits on the pyramid, it's a completion of the Tower of Babel and the One World Order. This is a very important speech to identify what's on the back of the dollar bill. Here is Frank, uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt's address before the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, November 11, 1940. And he goes on and talks about the Great Seal of the United States. Listen to this as he goes on to explain. He says, the Great Seal of the United States on the back of the dollar bill, he says, Welcome to the Age of Rome, an age of a strange a mixture of elections, laws, military, and dictatorship. And he talks about the Romans' collapse, and there was a dark period, and now there is a reawakening of a thousand years ago. He talks about a feudal system, an empire. So here he is saying that the great city of the United States, on the back of the dollar bill, is Rome, with its elections, laws, militaries, and dictatorship. Quite amazing. Look, the Pope has its own search engine. Welcome, Internet side of the Holy See. So the Pope is also called the Holy See. The Roman Catholic Knights Templars, the original protectors and servers. Protect and serve. You probably saw that on the cop cars years ago. Their motto is, when you protect something, you control it. 
When you continue to serve the thing you control, it is lulled into complacency. The complacency, the thing which is protected, never realizes it is controlled. Therefore, to control something, you must protect and serve it very well. You must be sure it, say, it stays so happy and complacent that it never even thinks about freedom, let alone seeks it. The perfect slave thinks he is free. That's the Knight Templar's model. Those of you that are from the UK, there's been news, headlines in the news that the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, ending its long-time armed campaign. And the IRA is nothing but the Catholics fighting the Protestants for control. It's been that way since 1970, and now it's 2005. And now, since we have uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, now we don't need the IRA because now the Catholics can go around under Al-Qaeda Al and bomb the world into submission to the Pope. As you can see in the article, the Catholic priest and the Protestant minister would be invited to witness the scrapping of the weapons. So both sides will take part to make sure that it's ended. But it hasn't ended. They just keep changing their face and put a new face on under a different name to keep people in the fog, in the smoke screen. The article in the same article goes on and says the IRA refused Protestant demands for disarmament. So over the years the Protestants wanted peace, but the Catholic IRA refused peace. So it's right here in our news articles, people. We need to start putting pieces of the puzzle together. Check this article out. CNN, Hitler orders Pope kidnapped January 15, 2005 on CNN. Check it out yourself. Hitler ordered Pope kidnapped, but leading German general refused to obey orders, newspapers said. Vatican City, Reuters. Adolf Hitler gave one of his generals a direct order to kidnap the Pope during World War II, but the officer did not obey. And Hitler was betrayed by the Vatican. That's what Satan always does. They always betray one another. And he figured if he got a hold of the Pope here and kidnap him, he'll have a chance to survive. And this is the article here, how the general refused Hitler's orders. Let's do, let's do a little review here. Uh, Martin Luther exposed the deceptions of the Roman Catholic Church by his 95 Thesis, The Bible versus the Church. This started the apostate movement called the Protestants. This created the army of the Pope, the Society of Jesus known as the Jesuits, was formed to counter the apostates in 1540. Now we're going to get into the creation of the army of the Pope in 1540, the Jesuits. This is the first church of the Jesuits. It was given to the Jesuits by the Pope, Pope Paul III. And here's the outside of the building, and we will now take a tour inside. This is the painting inside the Jesuit church, depicts Pope Paul III bringing the Society of Jesus into official existence in 1540. This society became the Pope's army. This here is the Lo Loyola, the first black general called the Black Pope of the Pope's army. And he's considered the White Pope, the infallible one we should worship. And he is the man behind the scenes that owns all the corporations of the world, all the banks, owns everything and forces everybody to worship the infallible white pope, which we will see. This new black pope, named Lo La Loyola, created the Illuminati, a satanic organization to control the minds of the European leaders through hypnosis, witchcraft, and mind control. This black pope, Lo Loyola, communed with the spirit world for advice in setting up this powerful and evil organization. The spirits were actually demons controlled by Satan, illuminating his mind. Satan is called the angel of light. Loyola developed his spiritual exorcist to bring one into spiritual perfection. Through systematic meditation, prayer, contemplation, visualization, illumination, the Loyola will go into trance and he would teach others exactly how to do it step by step, how to get into witchcraft, uh, new age uh, trance, meditation, prayer, and that's what we see around us right now. 
uh, himself. This is a photograph of inside the church of Jeju, and we'll take a close look at the sun worship. Here you see the sun god, the Egyptian sun god, the IHS, in the church of Jeju. So you can see the sun worship is everywhere. This is the current black pope, or the, or the, the uh, current general of the Jesuits. His name is Peter Hans Kovenbach, and he was initiated back in 1983. You can find this article in Jesuit.org, official website of the Jesuits. And in this article, when this uh, Kovenbach was elected the 29th Superior, Superior General of the Society of Jesus, the 33rd General Congregation of the Order, uh, Father Kovenbach was elected at a very sensitive time in the society uh, history. The white pope at the time, Pope John Paul II, wanted to put his own black pope in, but the society would not let the pope put his man in. So uh, one of the first tasks was to mend fences with the Vatican and restore Vatican's confidence in the, in the society was this pope's first duty. So you can see that this pope here uh, does not, is not controlled by the infallible white pope. As time went on, uh, the Society of Jesus, the general, got so powerful with his army that he started to kill off the white popes that he did not like. Here's a prime example of the pope lasting just 33 days in office, Pope John Paul I. He was killed in 1978. After only 33 days in occupying St. Peter's chair, this brave papal Caesar was poisoned by the Masonic agents of the Jesuits within Caesar's palace, the Vatican, found dead one morning by a nun, and there was never an autopsy, was never performed, and no official death certificate ever been issued. And that's what happens when you go against the black pope. He'll take you out and put a pope in of his own choosing. The Vatican controls the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds. It says right here, in July 1978, right after the Bilderberg meeting, the head of his family empire, John D. Rockefeller III, was murdered. Made it look like an accident. Likewise, in July of 1996, Rothschilds was found hanged in parents. Both Rockefellers and the Rothschilds were killed on about the same day in July to send a message that assassins like anniversaries. So you see here the Rockefellers and Rothschilds are nothing but the puppets of the Vatican whore. This is what researcher Hustus Mullins writes, that the Rothschilds took over all the financial operations of the worldwide Catholic Church in 1823. And there's his book and reference number, page 125. And as you look up Rothschilds in the Encyclopedia Judaica, in there it says that the Rothschilds bear the title Guardians of the Vatican's Treasury. Now you know where the Rockefellers and Rothschilds got their wealth. The Bible versus Catholic. True doctrine out of the Bible text versus false doctrine and the date that was introduced by the Catholic Church. Here's one example, call no man father, Matthew 23, 9. The Pope is called Holy Father. The year was in, uh, instituted, 610. Another example, don't worship men, Acts 10, 26. Kissing of the, fo the Pope's feet started in the year 709. Another one, leaders of the church must be married, 1 Timothy 2, 5. Celibacy was imposed in the year 1079. No pray repeating, Matthew 6, 7. Rosary introduced in the year 1090. The last one I'll give you, only the Creator is infallible, Matthew 19, 17. The Papal infallibility year 1870. So you can see the blasphemous between the church and the Bible. This Catholic Jesuit was responsible for the greatest scientific evolutionary hoax. 
this French Jesuit priest, he was responsible for the pit down man hoax called the greatest scientific hoax of the 20th century. He was also linked with the discovery of the strange disappearance of another ape man, pinky man. So here we have these Jesuit priests that are responsible for some of the greatest evolutionary hoax and they hide behind the mask of being a good Christian and they're just the opposite. Here's the Jesuit father of vaccines. His name is Edward Jenner and he wrote this book and it says here, Jenner figured that very few people would actually read the book but most would just look at the cover and make mental associations between smallpox and cowpox. Here's a photograph of Jenner inoculating his 18 month year old son with swinepox. His son will die of TB when he is 20. Here's another photo, uh, picture. Getting the jab. Jenner inoculates an eight, eight year old boy named James with cowpox. The boy will die of TB at 21. Erasmus, the, grand, the grandfather of ape man Charles Darwin, since Jenner, the Jesuit Jenner, claimed that humans and animals shared the same diseases, the next step was to proclamate the idea that they had a common ancestor. This is what da uh, Darwin said about Jenner and his vaccination in a letter that was written to Jenner uh, February 24th, 1802. And it goes on in the letter and it says, In a little time it may occur that the christening and the vaccination of children may always be performed on the same day. Christening means sprinkling babies with water to make them a Christians in the, in the, uh, the Jesuit uh, Vatican society. Well, christening and vaccination are the inventions of that old serpent, the devil. So what they want to do is they want to mix the blood of, a, of an animal and a human, and that will pollute God's uh, precious uh, baby, pure blood, and introduce diseases and other things, and it's a celebration, a sick celebration, of mixing ha animal blood and human blood together in a baptism. Here's another headline out of the Salt Lake Tribune, July 21st, 2005. Many of you heard that the gay marriage became legal in Canada, but what's interesting about this article was a legislation drafted by the Prime Minister, Paul Martin, a Roman Catholic. Should that surprise you? After World War II, the Vatican was scrambling to uh, cover up all of their uh, connections with uh, Hitler and the Third Reich, and uh, so they created Vatican II. In Vatican II, in, in the early 60s, they changed their laws. Instead of persecuting the Protestants, we just call them separate brethren. Now, since they've changed their philosophy, now the Pope go ahead, goes ahead and says, Heaven open to everyone, says Pope. And uh, so you have to be, says here, that Heaven is open to all as long as they are good. So they changed their tactics. Now they're all about lovey, lovey dove. This following article was featured February 4, 2003 in the Chicago Sun-Times newspaper. Vatican, Potter's Magic OK, witchcraft found not to be anti-Christian. So they speak on both sides of their face. So one, one time they're saying it's evil, one side says it's good, and it goes back and forth. This is the current black pope, considered the most powerful man in the world. And here's a diagram of how the pyramid is set up. First you have Satan on top of the pyramid, the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And then the next one in line is the black pope, the superior Jesuit general. And then it goes to the white pope, the papal Caesar. Remember Caesar, he sits on the throne of Caesar and also on the, on the, the throne of the church. So he has two roles, but he doesn't control nothing because the black pope controls it all. He replaces the white pope of his own choosing according to what Lucifer wants. Then it goes to the archbishops of New York and through them it goes to the Knights of Malta, Knights of Columbus, the Masonic Supreme, and then it's all broken down to the different secret societies on down from there. 
Here's another diagram of how the pyramid works. Comes through the Vatican, the Jesuit, the Black General, and then it goes down through the Illuminati, the CFR, the International Bankers, the Mafia, the Club of Rome, the Opus Dei, the Masons, the New Age movement. Remember, they're behind all of this New Age witchcraft movement. They create the problem and then they say, oh, we don't create it, we hide behind the sheep. We hold the sheep in front of us, so that's all you see. You don't see the wolf behind the sheep clothing. And so they, they're the creators of all this, and there's many more secret societies. But this is kind of a diagram you can see how, how it all operates. Here's an interview with the Jesuit in the Spectrum newspaper. With a, and the interview went on to say, and it says, What is the ultimate goal of the Jesuits? Their ultimate goal is to rule the world with the Pope of their making from Solomon's rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. That is their ultimate goal. And what is he going to do? He's going to destroy the Catholic Church. He's going to destroy the Vatican. And he's going to go down in Jerusalem and, de and, and demand to be worshipped as God for three and a half years. This is their plan, folks, is to deceive you. They'll destroy the Vatican. Nobody will have tie, will make connections between the Vatican and the new Antichrist. And then they'll have all people worship him after World War III. Why is April 15th so significant? It, it is the day that the Titanic was sunk. And what is so significant about the Titanic? Well, there was people that were against the Federal Reserve System, and so they were very wealthy, well-to-do people. And so the Vatican uh, built a, the Titanic for one reason only, and that was to get the rich people on board who were against the Federal Reserve System and to, uh, to sink it. And that was the whole reason behind the Titanic. Here's the Jesuit Father Brown who gave the orders to the captain of the Titanic to sink it. Here's, here's the captain of the Titanic right here. He was a Jesuit, and he's the one that took the orders from Jesuit Father Brown to sink the ship. And he's one of the last pictures that were taken. Here's another photograph from Father Brown's own very own camera documenting what's going on. And here is the captain of the Titanic looking over saying goodbye. You know, he has his orders now to sink the, sink the Titanic. Here's other photographs from Father Brown's camera documenting the people that are on the ship so they make sure that those who are against the, the Federal Reserve System are killed. The, the captain of the Titanic sailed that same route for over 20 years. He knew the waters as good as the back of his hand. He went pedal to the metal as fast as he could and when he hit the iceberg, he made sure that the light stayed on and the music kept playing. As the ships were passing at night, they saw white flares shooting in the skies. Now everybody knows in the Navy that if you shoot white flares, that it means that you're having a celebration, a party. Red flares means that you're in trouble and you're sending out an SOS for help. So the ships that were passing by at night and you can see this on the movie, The Titanic, that they shot white flares in the sky and not red ones. This is proof alone that this was done by design so they can sink and kill those who are on board. So approximately, approximately a year later after the Titanic was sunk, the Federal Reserve System came into power. And what does the Lord say about money? The love of money is the root of all evil. So basically the money on, that you're carrying in your pocket is nothing but the Jesuit controlled fiat currency. Why is April 15th so significant? It is the day that all 14th Amendment citizens of this American empire, like the good serfs that they are, go to confession once a year and confess to the government with their tax returns. We're going to show that you're a nothing but a Roman citizen under, under the 14th Amendment. First of all, we'll start out that in law, 
every letter in a word is important. We're going to show you in the Constitution between the difference between the big C versus the little c. To show you the difference, we're going to look into in this little book called the Constitution of the United States. If, if you have one, pick it up and look at it and read it and study it. The first time the Constitution met, mentions a citizen, it's in capital C of the United States. This is Article 1, Section 2. We're going to go through here and show you throughout this that there was a time when we, there were big capital C sovereign citizens of this country. It says here, no person except a natural born capital C citizen or a capital C citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall, shall be eligible to the office of President. We continue to highlight throughout the Constitution all the capital C citizenships. Again, and we see here, capital C, capital C. Now we're going into the Bill of Rights, and you can see that the citizenship is still under the capital C, sovereign. This is why the Jesuits are laughing so much, because they created a dual citizenship here in, here in the United States. This is the 14th Amendment. It was created on July 9th, 1868. And look at this, jurisdiction thereof are little C's citizenship. First time we've seen that in our Bill of Rights and our Constitution. Then it goes on, talks about the little C. And it says, to any person within its jurisdiction. So now we created a, a dual citizenship under the Vatican. If you look at the 12th, or excuse me, the 13th Amendment, prior to the 14th, when they changed the citizenship, it used to say their jurisdiction, meaning the state's jurisdiction. And as we see down here, now it says its jurisdiction, the federal's jurisdiction, which is basically under the Jesuits. After the amendment was changed in the 14th Amendment, you can see as you read on in the Constitution and Bill of Rights, you see that it says the right of the little c. I'm just showing you it continues, the right of the little c. Here's the 24th Amendment, Roman numerals, the right of the little c of the United States to vote. And here in Amendment 24 goes on and says the right of the little c of the United States. Now, if you want more information on this where you can prove it to yourself by doing your homework, go to the Internet, type into the search engine, 14th Am Amendment America, and you will find out what this is all about. You'll find out you're not under the jurisdiction of the United States Constitution, but that you're under uh, a jurisdiction that is foreign to our Constitution. I like to point this out. I got this in the mail. It's a voter registration. And on this registration it says, Voter Declaration and Big C Citizen Affidavit. And it says, I do swear and affirm under the penalties for voting fraud set forth in Utah Code and subject to the penalty of law for false statements that the information contained in this form is true, that I am a little C. Now, why would they put a big C and then they says, I swear by signing it that I'm trading in my big C citizenship in for a little C of the United States a uh, resident of the state of Utah. See how they get you? They do it through ignorance, folks. They send you these voter registration forms, the driver's license forms. You read it for yourself, and you'll see that there is a power shift from your sovereign citizen of the Constitution to a little c of the United States, which is a different uh, jurisdiction than the Constitution. What would it be like not to uh, go to confession and to confess about your income tax under the American 14th Amendment America. If we were the big C citizenship, we would be living the Constitution and following this amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. So we, we are commanded by God not to, or by the Constitution, not to confess, but yet we do it anyway, anyway because of the fear of the IRS and the Roman Empire. 
All mainstream churches were taken over by 1980. A secret sign was to be given to the Jesuits worldwide when the movement had successfully wiped out Protestants in preparation for the signing of the Concordat between the Vatican and the U.S. The sign was to be when a president of the U.S. took office facing the obelisk. For the first time in U.S. history, the swearing-in ceremonies were, ceremonies were moved to the west front of the Capitol, and President Ronald Reagan faced the Washington Monument. This happened on January 20, 1981. In 1981, a change was made in the Book of Mormon scripture. In 1 Nephi 13.24, the word plainness was taken out and fullness was replaced. Fullness is in the new edition of the Book of Mormon. And 1 Nephi 13.5, Nephi goes on to say that he sees in a great unabominable church, and I saw the devil, that he was the founder of it. And he goes on to say that this great and abominable church, that there were many plain and precious things taken away from the book. So here we're seeing what, what Nephi predicted would happen actually took place in the Book of Mormon in 1981. And he's telling us that the great and abominable church is behind uh, pulling out the scripture and changing the plainness of the gospel. And then Nephi says in uh, verse 29, he says, Because of the many plain and precious things which have been taken out of the book, which were plain unto the understanding of the children of men according to the plainness which is in the Lamb of God, because of these things which are taken away out of the gospel of the Lamb, an exceedingly great many do stumble, yea, inasmuch that Satan hath great power over them. So here Nephi's as his prophecy came to came true because he prophesied that the plainness of the scriptures would be changed and sure enough in 1981 they've taken out plainness and inserted fullness and that's uh, 1 Nephi 13:24 This is a worldnetdaily.com news article Saturday June 11th 2005 the headline is historian claims 9/11 plot by Vatican US and it goes on to say that an Egyptian historian, note historian, you got to know your history, claimed on Saudi television that the United States helped carry out a Vatican plot to destroy Islam by orchestrating the 9-11 attacks. See, the truth is, here's a list of the Jesuit generals, or black popes, starting with Loyola in 1541. And I'll just slowly take take down the list so you can take note. And it ends at Peter Hans Kovenbach to date. Revelation 17 verses 10 through 11, it says, "And there are seven kings, five are fallen. And here are the seven kings that John saw, and five are fallen. And he goes on and says, And one is, talking about the Roman Empire kingdom at that time, and the other is the Holy Roman Empire, he goes on to say, Not yet come in John's day. And when he cometh, he must continue for a short space. And the, and the beast, the Roman Empire that was and is not, the Holy Roman Empire, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. So we'll give birth to the eighth, the Holy Roman New World Order, and is of the seventh, the Holy Roman Catholic Monarchy mixes with the false Antichrist Church, and number six, the Roman Caesar State. So it's mixing church and state together. So you see John is clearly saying that the Holy Roman Empire is, uh, is bringing about this new world order. Here we got the four horsemen, 
we got the uh, the papal Caesar riding on the white horse, the infallible one. We have the black pope, which forces all to worship the uh, the infallible antichrist. We have death and the plagues and famine that rides this horse. And over here is Russia, and uh, the black uh, the black pope will use Russia as a hammer against the United the United States, and also. Russia is also going to be a hammer against Israel, and that's when Christ will come in and intervene at Armageddon. We're going to read a few scriptures out of Revelation 6 to show you the parallels between the Pope and the Antichrist. Revelation 6, 1 says this writer comes out of one of the seals of, of judgment that only the Lord Jesus could open. He has no title of his own, Revelation 6.2. He has a bow with no arrows. He carries no weapons. His followers fight for him, Revelation 6.2. He has only one crown which is given to him, Revelations 6.4-8. Destruction and hell follow, follow this writer, Revelation 6.4-8. This writer is the counterfeit Christ, the Antichrist. In Revelation 6. In Revelation 6, verse 2, it says he has no title of his own. When a man becomes a pope, he gives up his own name and is given a pontifical title, which gives him a new name. He no longer has the name he was born with. Fulfill in Revelation 6, 2. The Bible says he is given a crown. When the pope is crowned during his coronation, these words, among others, are spoken. Take thou the Tyra, adorned with the triple crown, and know that thou art the father of princes and kings and the governor of the world. He has no bow with no arrows. He carries no weapons. His followers fight for him. Although the Vatican is a sovereign political state, it has no official army of its own. The bowed crucifix the Pope carries was intentionally bowed to identify the Pope with the rider on the first horse. There's a photo of uh, the Pope with a bowed crucifix. Now that we covered the white horse, let's go now to the red horse. The rider on the red horse is communism. It is a documented fact that the Jesuits helped create, create and finance the Communist Party. Revelation 17.5. The red horse, red horse is war. Today, communism is sweeping the world in preparation for, for a one world government. Little do they know that they are being used by the forces of the Antichrist. Faithful U.S. Catholics under the leadership of their priests and bishops scream for the U.S. to disarm, paving the way for the rider on the red horse to gallop across our country. Legislation is now being pushed through our judicial system which will make it possible for our freedoms to be taken from us. Revelation chapter 6 verse 5 and 6 talks about the black horse, his famine. The rider of this horse reveals a pair of balances. The one scale shows his awesome power over the economy of the world to control food production. It's the black pope. His color black, the color of the Jesuit order, which, which seeks to dominate the world's economy for the Antichrist through the following front organizations. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the, of the earth. Revelation 6, verse 7 and 8. And when, he, and when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and the testimonies they held. Revelation 6, 9. Revelations 20, verse 4, 
I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And the chip they refused, and he causeth all, all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And what you're seeing is uh, in a Hitachi Super Micro Wireless RFID chip. And uh, this was back in 2003. Revelations 14.9 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So whatever you do, people, do not take the mark of the beast. This book you can find at Barnes, Barnes & Noble. It's called The Secret Society's Handbook. Here are just a few of the secret societies that the Vatican is behind. But most people that are in these individual secret societies, uh, most of them don't know that there's a ring inside the onion, that there's another ring and another ring that uh, goes back to the Holy See. Here are just a few more of those secret societies that's covered in this book, well documented. At the end of this book, it says, Now that you have finished this book, you are probably thinking, If everything I have read is true, and they are so powerful, how come they allow it to be published at all? Why didn't they suppress such high sensitive information? That's easy. They rely on self-censorship, refusing to believe what we cannot comprehend or to ignore that which frightens us is human nature. Still unconvinced? How many reasons have you already invented to reassure yourself that none of this is true? If you want to read more history of how, this, how the Vatican was behind the Civil War, you, you have to read this book called The Fifty Years in the Church of Rome. And this talks about Abraham Lincoln coming to his defense to defend. He was a priest, a Catholic priest, and, uh, and it talks about the Civil War, and he was an insider, and it goes through the whole history of that time era. For more information, you want to go to this website, www.chick.com, and their phone number in California is 909-987-0771. Here are some rec here's some recommended reading. It's called the Alberto series. It's 1475, and uh, you ask for number 931. And you'll get the whole series, six full color, 32 page comics, and the big betrayal, 64 pages. This book is a hot seller. Did the Catholic Church give us the Bible? It talks about how we got the King James Bible and how the, uh, how the Catholic Church tried to do everything it can to destroy uh, King James and the King James Version of the Bible. If you can get this book, this is a gold mine. This is a great book. It was published in 2001, and uh, it's called The Vatican Assassins, and you can look that up on the Internet. And here's the back of that book. It covers in great detail the history and how, it all, and how everything ties back to the Vatican. If you really want to get into the nitty-gritty of the history, this is a book to get, The Secret History of the Jesuits. I think this book shocked me the most. It 
It's called The Priest, The Woman, and The Confessional. And you get to see how the confessions lead to the, the uh, destruction of the family. And this is such a revealing book uh, that just shocked me to death. And of course this book. And of course the title of this video, Smoke Screens, Who is the Whore of Revelation. And this book called The Holocaust Chronicles, you can actually read the entire book online at holocaustchronicles.com. I'd like to end this video with this message. Condemnation without investigation is the highest form of ignorance. I can resist. Jesus Christ predicted the papacy as the Antichrist. There is not one word in all Christ's prophecy concerning the end of time and his second coming about one man, Antichrist, or one man, false prophet. Read and see for yourself. Christ predicts the dynasty of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Note carefully his language. He warns in Matthew chapter 24 against the, the deception of the Antichrist but never uses a singular in his references. He speaks of the dynasty of many, not one. For many shall come in my name. Matthew 24, 5. The Pope is the only person who fits the prediction saying, I am Christ. Matthew 24, 5. I am the way, the truth, and the life, says Pope Pius IX. Christ has told us that many false Christs will appear after his ascension to glory and before his return. When we open the pages of history, we see how our Lord's words have been so literally fulfilled. Ever since, ever since the Bishop of Rome got a taste for power early in the Christian era, he yelled, I am Christ right down to Pope Benedict XVI. They have been yelling it, shouting it, triumphing it, and parrying it. The halls of Christendom have, been, have not been without this den for 16 centuries. Now we have 266 popes that call themselves the Vicar of Christ. I am Christ. If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. And the angel said unto me, Behold the formation of a church which is most abominable above all other churches, which slayeth the saints of God, yea, and tortureth them, and bindeth them down, and yoketh them with a yoke of iron, and bringeth them down into captivity. 1 Nephi 
Welcome back to the Rome Empire Rules Today disc number two. Now if you don't have this disc number one, uh, see if you can't get it and watch it first. And then the second disc we're going to get into is going to shed tremendous amount of light that uh, I did not share with you on the first disc. The Catholic Church picked up where Rome left off. Where Nero of ancient Rome uh, crucified Peter upside down for his Christian beliefs, and also the Roman Holy Roman Empire or the Catholic Church uh, Inquisition people who read the Bible or did not follow the doctrines of their church. And here you see the Inquisition going on of the burning of the feet. This looks like what we carry in the Olympics, the the uh, flame represents the sun bale, which we'll get into more. This looks like a stocking we hang on our Christmas right above our, our fireplace uh, for, for at Christmas time. Uh, here again, you see uh, they're drowning this guy in water. They fill his lungs up full of water as a form of torture. And as we scan across the page here, uh, we'll see there's the crucifixion of Christ right here because they love they worship death and that's why they always depict Christ on a cross is because they worship his death not his resurrection or life and that's why every time you see the Christ on a cross you know what the real meaning is is the inquisition of all those who oppose the Roman Empire today this is the pay scale of the archbishop right here. The Catholic archbishop paid the high executioner. And here you see what they were paid for tearing apart and quartering by four horses. Uh, we could say that R represents dollars to make it simple. Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, up here, the dollars and cents. But you could see here the tearing part of quartering by four horsemen, uh, the beheading, as you cruise down the burning alive uh, for breaking alive on the wheel just on and on all the different inquisitions that they were the executioners were paid and you can see all the different things uh, for beheading <clears throat> and sticking the head on a pole uh, you got paid uh, 326 uh, and so you can see how disgusting this whole thing is. Here's a Protestant. Here you can see a man being four quartered for not reading this, for having the scriptures and reading it. And you can see nothing has changed over history. Here's a close up of uh, Christ being uh, the, where they worship death and not life. Here's the Pope. He always carries a staff with him all the time. On Sunday, the Catholics did not want to kill their subjects by torturing them. They wanted to keep them alive just enough so they can burn them on Sunday. And all Catholics had to attend, and if not, they were considered a heretic, and they were also inquisitioned. Now we're going to fast forward it today, and, we're, and nothing has changed. We have the Holocaust and uh, we'll get into the inquisitions that's going on all, all the way up till the present. Where did the word Holocaust derive from? Well, let's see here in the Catholic Bible. This is what it says in Leviticus, or excuse me, Numbers chapter 29. And ye shall offer a Holocaust. And if you look at the King James Version or any other Bible translation version, they all say, and ye shall offer a burnt offering. And so, as we look, as we look at Norm William J Davis Jr., he points out that studying together, him and his Catholic friend, we found that the word Holocaust was used more than 150 times in the Catholic Bible, but never once in the King James or any other Bible translation. He says, he, he, Noah Webster, the great linguist, scholar, who first gave us his famous, famous dictionary in 1828, also published a very good translation of the Bible. 
He did not use the word holocaust for burnt offering. Holocaust is a strange word used by both Christians and Jews describing what they characterize as Germany's final solution to the Jewish questions. Yet Holocaust has neither a Hebrew, Yiddish, German, or English origin, and its word that has a Greek origin, meaning to be burnt whole, how that Greek word managed to get into the Hebrew translation of the Catholic Bible, I can only speculate. So here they're trying to understand where this word even, how they even got it from the translation of uh, the different languages, and they can't figure that out. But as you go on to read uh, down here in 2 Kings 23.10, the Bible uses the phrase, passing through the fire of Moloch. This is the Holocaust that is an abomination, but is still a burnt offering to the God, to a God. Remember, Regardless of whether the burnt offering is to the Almighty God or whether the Holocaust is for pleasure of the pagan god Moloch, it is a sacrifice. Holocausts are sacrifices. A burnt offering to Almighty God done by Israel was the sweet smell of cattle and sheep consumed on the altar. The Holocaust of the seed of the serpent was always the sacrifice of their own children, making them pass through the fire. Holocaust to Moloch. And so you can see that it also uh, goes to uh, uh, what they do today at the Bohemian Grove in Northern California. If you haven't seen that tape, you need to see that also. This is in Numbers uh, 29, and you can see the word Holocaust is used 150 times throughout the, the Catholic Bible. And uh, you notice the Catholic Bible came out before the King James Version of the Bible, and nobody wanted the Catholic Bible for the fact that they knew that at one time you were killed for reading the Bible. So none of the Protestants even wanted to have anything to do with the Catholics' version of, the, uh, of their version of the Bible. There's the word Holocaust, one example. It's interesting to note in their Catholic Bible here, in chapter 17 of Revelations, in their footnotes, it says the great city is Rome, and then it goes on and says Babylon is a symbolic name of Rome, uh, is e e geographically described as the great harlot. And here they are admitting that they are the great harlot. And then here it says the seven hills of Rome. And if you cruise down a little bit, look at this, pretty fascinating. It says the beast is Nero, revived Nero, the beast. Uh, Rome to what? To regain power. Rome to regain power. And then as you go on here, check this out. Uh, at the end of the footnotes here, it says, not to, oh, it's right here, let's go, it's, and then it says, the, against the harlot Rome, the great city, and then here is not to be taken literally. I thought that was interesting. Here they describe that they're, they're the great harlot that's spoken of in Revelation 17, and then they come down here and say, is not to be taken literally. Isn't that something? For those that don't know, the New American Bible is the Catholic version of the Bible. Now I'm going to prove to you that this symbol right here is not a Christian symbol, but it is a symbol of Baal, and I will show you that. Of course, I'll show you on his hat is a symbol of, of Babylon, and here the cross, which they call the Christian cross, is nothing but a symbol of Babylon. Here is more symbolism on the Pope's uniform symbol of Babylon. Of course, they call that the Iron Cross or the Maltese Cross, but it's a symbol of the sun god Baal. Even in the Egyptian tombstones before Christ came along, or Christianity, they had the symbols of Baal, the sun cross. Here it is right here. And here in Newsweek, uh, Business Week, it says the Ankh, the, uh, the uh, god of Egypt, has been transformed into a Christian cross. Now we're going to dig and find out where that, where that goes back to Babylon. This is the proof where this, this iron cross uh, is, is not Christian, but it goes back to Babylon. And this is where it came from right here. Let me scroll down. Right here is the proof. It's a Babylonian uh, plow. Uh, right here, it's uh, from the Museum of the University of Pennsylvania. And it's a gang of men plowing and sowing, and from a Babylonian seal impression of the 14th century B.C. And so this is the proof right here. 
that if you look up, there's the, the farmers plowing, and here you see, as clear as day, is there's the symbol of the sun symbol, S-U-N, the symbol of Babylon, Baal. And you can see it is worn by Adolf Hitler over his heart, the symbol of Baal. And there are uh, all the uh, Nazis and, and Germany at the time. This is the German uh, uh, mark of Germany. And you can see the symbols of the sun and Baal, the sun god. This is the symbols of the First Reich of the Holy Roman Empire. And there's, this, there's the king's hat with the symbol of Babylon or Baal, the sun god. There's a symbol of Baal on the Second Reich flag. And here's the symbol of the Third Reich. Uh, and here you see the symbols of Baal, the sun god, on the Nazi flags. This is a 33rd degree uh, medal that is worn by the 33rd degree Masons. And here you see the Baal symbol. And right here, we're going we're gonna to put this word that runs around the uh, edge here uh, and Google on the internet and find out what it says and here you see order out of chaos all in Latin for those who have internet uh, the word that goes around this ring right here spells S-A-P-I-E-N-T-I-A -E so S-A-P-I-E-N-T-I-A -E and if you type that into Google the search engine will take you to the, the uh, Constitution of the Supreme Pontiff Pope. So here you see that the 33rd degree leads you to the Supreme Constitution of, of the Pontiff Pope. And you can do that on your internet. Just go to Google, type in that word, and you can see the direct connection through Freemasonry up through the Pope. And you, here you can see on their emblem is the three-finger salute, and right there is the guard that swears to protect the Pope, the Swiss Guard at the Vatican, is doing the three fingers salute as an oath of office to protect the Pope, and that represents the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost type uh, three finger salute. And here you see you got the York Rite and you have the Scottish Rite. And you see as you climb the ladder on both sides, you have the Order of the Red Cross, the Order of the Knights of Malta the Order of the Knights Templar, and so you see these are all Catholic uh, levels as you go up to the 33rd degree, and here you got the Scottish Rite, and look at this, the Grand Pontiff is a level, that's the Pope's office, the Knights, anytime there's a Knight, I will show you, the Knights means ancient Rome, look at this, the Knights of the Sun, S-U-N, so each each one of the, uh, the each parcel here goes right up to the 33rd degree which is if you follow it up you'll see right here there's the emblem of the 33rd degree that leads you right to the supreme pontiff pope constitution here's the symbol of babylon here we the official united states army gives the iron cross this one here to the shoot the, the marksman shooting badge this one you get for uh, u.s army sharpshooter badge and here is the expert shooting badge. And as you can see, here's the, the reef of the olive branch. It's like when you win a race in the Olympics, they put the olive branch around your head. So here is a symbol of the olive branch around the sun symbol of Baal. Here's a statue of the first general of the Jesuits, Loyola, and his Inquisition skull. And here he is, and he's holding the Inquisition skull of the, of the Protestants, of the Protestants. And this is found at the University Church in Seville, Spain. This is an article at a Time magazine, March 19, 2006, and the headline is Spanish Inquisition, Gibson Agrees, Mel Gibson. And it goes on and says, If he is so morbidly fascinated with the bloody deeds of the Jewish Pharisees and the Mayan priests, he doesn't hold a mirror to his own church and film the Spanish Inquisition. But Mel Gibson won't say that he's, that's, a, that, that's a future plan, but he nods and agrees that there are monsters in every culture. So isn't that interesting about the Inquisition of the Catholic Church is so it's hid. In the scriptures it says, the woman and the beast that carrieth her, Revelation 17, 7. And here you see on the European Union coin, the woman riding the beast. Now the, and in Revelation 17, 1, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And here you see the European Union Parliament postage stamps issued in 1984 
Here you have the woman, which we understand is the whore, and she's riding the beast upon the many waters, and there's the fish. So they're so blunt, they just stick this right on their postage stamps and on their money. And as you cruise down a little bit further here, you can also see this is the European Union office, and they got the, the, the whore right in the beast, a statue outside the European Union office in Brussels, and the woman riding the beast. Here's Time Magazine, February 24th, 1992, and the cover story is The Holy Alliance, and you got Reagan and the Pope, and it says how Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solidarity moment, movement and, and hasten the demise of communism. And the article goes on, and it says, look what happened out of this secret agreement that they kept secret from the, uh, the, the American people and the world. And look what happened when they had their secret meeting they both brought down the Berlin Wall, ended the Cold War, and completely unraveled Soviet communism. And uh, here you can see any time we get in bed with the Roman, Holy Roman Empire, things happen. For those that don't know, we now have a Roman majority, Roman Catholic majority on our Supreme Court as of uh, February uh, 2006. Uh, you can go to chick.com. And uh, most people are not aware of the Catholics have been taken taken over our high offices. Of course, Ronald Reagan, when he did the secret deal with the popes, the Knights honor Reagan. And this is out of the New York Times, January 3rd, 1989. And it says here, the Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of St. John's, Jerusalem, and Rhodes of, and of Malta, Knights of Malta, presented uh, the Grand Cross of Merit Special Class to President Reagan. And it says here that Mr. Reagan will be the first American president so honored. The first American. That's very important. Once we get into the Lincoln assassination and see what happened, uh, the true story behind that. And here's the uh, front cover of uh, Time Magazine, the Holy Alliance. Inside the Time Magazine, it says Ronald Reagan and John Paul II, the Pope, secretly joined forces. Inside this Time Magazine article, Alexander Haig uh, said this in Time Magazine, The Vatican's information was absolutely better and quicker than ours in every respect. Here, we're the ones that have spent all this money for Echelon and everything with the, the satellites and so forth, but the Vatican has better intelligence than America. This is during the Cold War. How is that? And this revealing article continues to say, listen to the Holy Father. We have 2,000 years of experience at this. Yeah, persecuting the saints and anybody didn't go with, along with them ever since the Roman Empire through the Inquisition years of the Holy Roman Catholic Church up to, the, up to this time. Sure, they got lots of experience. So we need to listen to our Holy Roman Empire, the Holy See. This is Time Magazine, September 16, 1957, and here you have a quote right underneath the Black Pope. It says, Would John Adams still cry damnation? And as you can see this article, there's the Black Pope at that time in 1957. Then you read down here what, uh, what John Adams says. John Adams, the founding father, says, If there... If ever there was a body of men who merit eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is this society of loyalists. And there you go. The Founding Fathers knew who were the enemies of America were. This is a book by Thomas Paine called Common Sense. And on page 33, he says this, But Britain is the parent company, say some. But it happens not to be true, or only partly so. And, and the phrase, parent or mother country, hath been hath been Jesuitically adopted by the king and his parasites with a low papistolical design of gaining an unfair bias on the credulous weakness of our minds. Europe and not England is the parent country of America. This is out of Thomas Paine's book, Common Sense, page 33. He says here, it's been a Jesuitically, Jesuitically adopted by the king and his parasites with a low papistolical design of gaining unfair uh, power. Again, he says it's Europe and not England that is a parent country, uh, parent country of America. So it's basically the popes and his Jesuit power that's gained control of America. On page 31 of the same book, Thomas Paine goes on to say, politics is, is struck, a new method of thinking hath arisen. All plans, proposals, etc., 
prior to the 19th of April is uh, to the commitments of hostilities. Now we're going to find out what April 19th is all about. Why is April 19th so important? Look what happened on April 19th, 1993. We had Waco. April 19, 1995, we had Oklahoma City bombing. Let's go on to see what else has happened. Uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, right here, announced the United States will be abandoned, abandoning the gold standard. Look what else happened on April 19th. We had the American Civil War. In 1775, we had the American Revolutionary War. What is so important about April 19th? And then we go right up here, and here we find out April 19th is the beginning of Protestantism, our Protestant movement. And it all started by Martin Luther, or, or excuse me, yeah, Martin Luther. And here you go on to say, in 1529, at the Diet of Spire, a group of rulers, Germany, and independent cities of Germany, protested reinstatement of the Edict of Worms, and this was born the beginning of the Protestant movement. And so, look what happened on April 19th. April 19th is the beginning of the Protestant or Protestant movement against the Catholic Church. Now you know why April 19th is so important. So out of that, we have the American Revolutionary War, the American Civil War, we have the banning of the gold standard by Roosevelt, Waco, Oklahoma bombing, and look what happened in 2005 here. We had Joseph Ratzinger, the current pope, who was elected pope on April 19th. And then look at this. Easter Sunday falls on April 19th more often than any other date. And you can find this from Wikipedia, Wikipedia Encyclopedia Online. This is a really interesting article here in the AP, uh, March 14th, 2007. Here you have the Russian president, Putin, meeting with, with uh, uh, Santa Claus. He looks, he's the Pope, the current Pope, Benedict. Anyway, look what the article goes on to say. It says, Benedict wished Putin a warm welcome to the Vatican in the Pope's native language, the language of their talks. I didn't know Putin and, and the Pope spoke native language. Uh, German was their native language. They spoke to one another. It's interesting how it all comes together. I'm going to show you a few things out of this book called Hitler's Pope. Inside the book, this is a photograph of the signing of the Third Reich. And right here in the center of the picture is the man who spurred on the Third Reich, the signing of the agreement, the concordant between uh, the Catholic Roman Church to govern over Germany. That's what the Reich is. His name is Purcellis. He presides over the signing of the Reich concordant at the Vatican on July 20th, 1933. Okay, this is really big. Pay attention to this. This is Purcelli right here on his coordination day, March 12, 1939, on the eve of World War II. And look at this. Here he is being inaugurated as Pope on the eve of World War II. And the next day he has the Holy Crusades against Europe. And so he's the one who signed the Third Reich and who spurred it on. And then, years later, in 1939, on the eve of World War II, he starts the Holy Roman Crusades once again. Pope Leo the uh, the Twelfth had the above medal minted in 1825. And as you can see here on the back of the medal here, this word that reads around the block, Sedet Super Universalum, declaring her seat of, of authority as universal, over the entire globe. And here he is sitting on the globe. She's sitting there. And here she has the sun and the, the bell sun symbol. And here she's holding the golden cup in her hand, just like in Revelation 17 talks about. Okay, pay attention to this. This is very important. The Pope had two special forces, the Knights Templar that was formed in 1118 and the Knights Hospitallers that was formed in 1113. Now this is out of the, uh, the, the dictionary. It goes on to say the Knights Templar uh, was suppressed in 1312. We'll get into more, more into that. But look at the second definition. A man belonging to the Masonic Order in the United States. Right out of the dictionary. You don't have to look very hard to see where the Freemasonry comes from. Okay, when the Knights Templar were suppressed in 1312, the Knights Templar, uh, they wore a red cross and a white brown, 
on a white background until they were disbanded and their property and wealth passed to the Knights Hospitallers. Okay, this is out of the New Catholic Dictionary. And it says the Knights Templar is known today as the Knights of Malta. Thus we have the Maltese Cross right here. The Iron Cross and the Maltese Cross is the Cross of Babylon, of Baal the Sun God. So if you go on and read in the Catholic Dictionary, it says here the Knights Hospitallers is known now as the Knights of Malta. Uh, they changed their names, uh, and the Knights Hospitaller changed their names to the Knights of Rhodes, Rhodes Scholar, sound familiar? And then they changed their name again in the 1530s as the Knights of Malta. And this is where the Black Pope meets with the Knights of Malta that controls all the corporations of the world, the international banking of the world, and all the secret societies branch down from there. Okay, when the Knights Templar, their logo was a red cross on a white background. Uh, does that look familiar? Red cross on a white background, American Red Cross. And then if you go on and read... The Knights Hospitallers controlled the hospital system. Where do you think the word hospital came from? So here you see that all along the American Red Cross, the hospital system, is named after the Knights Hospitallers. And of course, they were the ones who took care of the injured and the, and the sick. And of course, who's the most important person in, in the military is the medic. You always protect him. And so here, around 1113, Pope uh, Pascal II acknowledged the hospitaler as a religious order. So even the hospital system, the American Red Cross, you can see the, the symbol here of Baal, you can see it all leads back to Rome, or leads back to Babylon. This is on December 1st, 2006, and this is the New Mexican president. He takes the Roman oath of office, and as you see in my first video, I get into that in the encyclopedia. That's not, that's not the Hitler salute, that's the Roman salute. And as you can see, his competitor, he lost by 1%, also is doing the Roman salute. And here you see in the background, this is the official mascot of ancient Rome, was the eagle. This is out of Fox News, and uh, this is December 20th, 2006. And the headline is, Jesus Christ to be Honorary King of Poland. And it goes on, Poland, lawmakers have drawn up a resolution naming Jesus Christ as the honorary king of Poland, but have failed to win support from the country's powerful Roman Catholic Church. Isn't that interesting? This is very interesting. You can't have Jesus Christ as your king in European Union, but you can have the Pope's statue goes up in France despite protests, November 28, 2006. Here you see the Pope's statue in bronze, even though the people 500 marched to uh, not have this statue go up because French law says separating church from the state. And I put not. It's kind of interesting that you can't have Jesus Christ as your king, but you can have the Pope statue uh, put up in, 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 in France. Uh, this is out of December 23, 2006. Bono to receive honorary knighthood. The Irish rocker is going to receive the knighthood honor. So the scriptures say that everything leads back to Babylon. And so here in CNN, February 13, 2002, says Giuliani joins a distinguished club. Uh, it says England, when uh, Rudolph Giuliani receives his honorary knighthood from Queen Elizabeth II on Wednesday, he joined an exclusive club with membership dating back to what? Ancient Rome. What doesn't lead back to Rome? So now whenever you hear the word knighthood, now it tells you where the roots come from is ancient Rome. Okay, this is very key right here, pay attention. Dagon, their Babylonian god. If you read Judges in the Old Testament, chapter 16, verse 23, and it says, And the lords of the Philistines gather them together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their god. And so what I did is I went down to the Webster Dictionary, and it says, What's the definition? Dagon, little fish. Dagon equals a fish. The fish god, uh, the national god of the Philistines. This idol had a body of a fish with the head and hands of a man. It was an Assyrian Babylonian deity. So now we know that that's a Babylonian deity. So if we go up here, we can see here's the old Babylonian deity with the, the fish head. And here you see the Pope Benedict with his fish hat showing you that he is the priest of Babylon. 
here it is, walking in darkness and noonday. These symbols are right in her face. And here you see the, 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 the priest of Babylon, the, like the scriptures to warn us about. Here you see the Pope wearing, uh, the, that represents uh, Dagon, the Babylonian deity. This is at uh, November 11th, 2006, Kissinger, Pope's advisor. Isn't that interesting that all these New World Order characters are all linked with the Pope? This is the Capitol building at Washington, D.C. And I also wanted to look up the word capital, uh, what that word actually means. And also each state has this capital, which looks like a woman's boob here. And we'll look that word up now. So this is what it says as of, out of the Webster Dictionary. I looked up the word capital, and it's uh, Latin for capitalum. The Temple of Jupiter. Now, Jupiter was the ancient god of ancient Rome. The Temple of Jupiter. Isn't that interesting? At Rome on the Capitoline Hill. And this is right out of the, uh, the, the Webster Dictionary. A building in which a state legislator body meets. The building in which the functions of state government are carried out and the building at which the United States Congress meets in Washington. So I looked up the word Capitoline Hill. It's the highest of the seven hills of Rome. The English word capital derives from Capitoline Hill. And this is right in the scriptures. If you read, it says that this Roman church sits on the seven hills. And on top of the seven hills is the capital, which represents the temple of Jupiter, the ancient god of ancient Rome. Isn't that fascinating? Interesting to note, the Temple of Jupiter's, here you got Vatican Rome, and you got Washington, D.C., the headquarter buildings mirror each other. Here you got the, the capital, and you got the obelisk uh, Nimrod, which is Nimrod is Baal, the obelisk, and the front is male, and you got female in the background, and it's interesting that both Vatican Rome and Washington, D.C. mirror each other. So now I had to look up the word pontiff. That's another name for the pope. And if you look at the ancient Roman Pontifus Maximus, and it ties with the modern Roman Pontifus Maximus, and you go down here to the encyclopedia, and you see here that the Pontifus Maximus were held by the different Caesars from 1533 of ancient Rome all the way up to Caesar uh, in 12 BC. And then in this encyclopedia says, then it was held by Pope Gregory I to the present, held by the popes. And so you hear ancient Rome of Pontifus Maximus with modern. And so here you got Pontiff, short for Pontifex. I like this quote, the beginning of wisdom is the omission of ignorance. And here you see the signing of the Third Reich. Uh, very few people ask what the First Reich is or the Second Reich. And anyway, I looked up the word concordant because that's what they signed, and so I looked up in the dictionary under concordant, and this is what it says, an agreement between the Pope and a government. So I looked up the encyclopedia under and looked up concordant in the encyclopedia, and this is what it says, an agreement specifically between the Pope and the temporal authority of the state, a contract between church and state. There you go. Now you know why the founding fathers said that they did not want to have church and state uh, because they saw what happened in Europe all those years with the, the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church in bed with the European kings. This is interesting out of an old uh, history book. Here it looks like the Nazis are having a prayer circle and the three fingers salute. And you can see the prayer circles are having and initiating the new troops. And of course, what do they swear an allegiance to? They swear an allegiance to the Reich, which is the Holy Roman Empire, which is a contract between church and state, making the Catholic Church the government of God of that state. It's very interesting out of that same history book. Uh, here you see the people wait uh, in food lines. And I thought I'd read this to you because this is fascinating. It says, in 100,000 Reichmarks, which two months previously would have bought a house, two months later it could buy a loaf of bread. So that's why Brigham Young and everybody says, get your food storage, get it now, because one day a loaf of bread will be able to buy you a house. I was flipping through the news. This didn't surprise me. The Roman Catholic mayor of Bethlehem. So isn't it interesting? As you start doing some digging, you find out that mayors and people in high positions of government around the world are Roman Catholic. This is Coronado Naval Base in San Diego, United States. And here, this is Google. You can find out for yourself. Go on the Internet and blow this picture up. And right on the U.S. Naval Base, you have a SWAT sticker 
are the symbol of Babylon from the sky. Isn't that very interesting? And I picked this up at the gun show. There was these veterans of foreign wars of the United States, and you can see all along who they've been fighting for. Of course, it's Rome. They've been fighting for the Roman Empire. Also, it goes back to Babylon, because there's a Babylon sun symbol. I don't know, once you're aware of what's going on, look at your credit cards. The American Express Business, and look who they have here. They have a Roman soldier on your American Express credit card. So just look around, you can see the symbols of Rome everywhere. Now we're going to back up into history and find out who really killed President Abraham Lincoln, who assassinated him. And, what, and so I'll show you a few photographs here. This is the book that has the trials of Abraham Lincoln in it that's basically suppressed from the public because the Jesuits do not want you to read true history of who was behind the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, inside the book, this is the man here who wrote the book. Uh, this is uh, the general who sat on the military commission that trialed and executed eight of Abraham Lincoln's assassination uh, people. And uh, he's standing right here. As you flip the book right here, you can see uh, his name is Thomas M. Harris. He's a, he's a Brigadier General, and the book was written in 1897. And so this book was heavily suppressed, and it's recommended reading. When the Jesuits take an oath of office, they swear to kill their enemies by the poisonous cup or by the laden bullet. And if you look at all the president, presidents of the United States, they were all either killed by the poisonous cup or the laden bullet. And here's the first president that was assassinated, was President Henry Harris in 1841. And here you got President Zachary Taylor. He was also poisoned and killed in 1850. And then here are two presidents that were assassinated by the laden bullet. It, uh, this one here is James Garfield in 1881. And also over here is uh, President William McKinley in 1901. And, of course, they assassinated uh, Abraham Lincoln also by the laden bullet. So we flip the page over here, and you got this man here, James Buchanan, which he was, they were trying to poison him because all of the men of the north drank tea and all the men of the south uh, drank coffee. And so what they did is they poisoned him, all the tea, and then all the ones who drank tea, most of them died. So it says in 1857, February... Uh, President James Buchanan escaped uh, a wholesale poisoning in which 50 were affected and 38 died. And, uh, and so anyway, there's a great long history of poisonings and death. And Abraham Lincoln here was shot by the laden bullet, uh, with JFK also was shot by the laden bullet. Here's a photograph of Ford's theater. And during the assassination, uh, John uh, Surratt, who, who was the Jesuit accomplice that got uh, Booth to go in, in, in there to assassinate, stood outside and counted, and many of the, tr uh, the witnesses uh, uh, witnessed uh, John Surratt as John Booth entered into the building. And here you see inside depicting John Booth murdering uh, Abraham Lincoln, jumped off the stage and ran. And what's interesting is when they finally caught up with John Booth, he had a, a, a Catholic medallion hung, uh, held in his hand as he clutched it when he was shot to death at a barn. But what's really interesting about John Surratt is they spent 18 months looking for him, and uh, obviously they killed his, his mother because her, her, the mother was involved in the conspiracy uh, and, and, and used her house was the location of all these people who were secretly conspiring to kill Lincoln. Well, anyway, when they finally caught up, with John Surratt, it took them 18 months to find him, and they had a $25,000 reward, uh, dead or alive. And when they finally found this John Surratt, guess where he was? Here he is, John Harrison Surratt, in a papal uniform at the time of his arrest and return to the United States. Here's John Surratt in his Pope's uniform. He's the bodyguard of the Pope. Isn't that interesting? 18 months, they finally caught up with this character, and here he is as the Pope's personal bodyguard. And no wonder this history has been buried. All you have to do is read the trial of John Surratt that's in the government congressional papers. 
Again, this book is very important. It's all documented by that general that sat on the board of the trials. Uh, this book is called Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln by Thomas M. Harris, late Brigadier General. And this book is uh, very important to read and understand true history. Very few people know the history of Cro Croatia, how it was made into a state in uh, 1941. But this book here talks about the whole history, and it's called The Vatican's Holocaust. And what happened was the Vatican wanted its own independent state, and so they, they formed a state out of Yugoslavia. They took the southern part and formed Croatia, and the Catholics killed one-third of the entire population of Croatia, uh, and they, most of them were Ether, Eastern Orthodox, and you never hear this in your history books. They always say it's always the Jews, it's always the Jews. No, you need to read the history of Croatia. And uh, this book is written by this man right here, and his name is Avro Manhattan, and uh, he's a resident of London, and during World War II, he operated a radio station called Radio Freedom broadcasting to occupied Europe. This man found out that the Vatican was behind World War II, behind Hitler, in fact, behind everyone, behind the banking, the international banking system. And he wrote like a dozen books or so uh, talking about uh, these atrocities and who is truly behind it all. This book is very heavily documented with pictures and documentation. Here you see a Catholic priest, and here he is changing uniform into a uh, 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 Utashis is what they were called in Croatia uh, and when the Nazis swept through the Europe uh, it opened the, the window and the door for the Catholics to have the Utashis uh, dress in their uniforms, have concentration camps and so forth to kill uh, one-third of the entire population of Croatia. Here you see on page 68 the Catholic priest here is given all those souls wish not to be uh, killed the, the option of either being baptized into the Catholic Church or being put to death. And here you see uh, him baptizing those who do not want to be killed. So they will swear an allegiance to the Pope and Rome instead of death. These are the atrocities you see here in Croatia. And, uh, of course, they all, all want to talk about Germany, but they never want to talk about the Utashis and the Catholics killing all the Orthodox and all those who oppose the Catholic Church. Here they hold up as trophies. The Catholics held up the Protestants uh, of the Catholic Church, or Protestants of the Catholic Church. And this guy's head is actually cut off, and he's holding the head on so he can have his trophy picture taken. Interesting to note, back in 1776, Adam Weishaupt, who founded the Illuminati, was a Jesuit at, at uh, the Jesuit uh, University and uh, uh, Germany, and what happened was uh, he was Jewish, and they call him crypto-Jews. Whenever a Jew swears his allegiance to Rome and gets baptized into Rome, if you look up that word crypto-Jew, it tells you that's what the definition means, a Jew that swears an allegiance to Rome. Anyway, it's interesting that the Illuminati, basically, uh, they... Uh, made sure that they blamed the Jews for everything. That was part of their, their great secret, is that every time uh, somebody would see uh, everything that was after 1776, let's get this straight, uh, none of the Jews had any power before 1776. All their power came after 1776, like the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, all those were established after 1776, Thus, everybody blames everything on the Jews. And this was the whole plan of uh, Adam Weishaupt and, and the Illuminati, uh, which is a branch of the uh, Jesuits. And, uh, and so just think about it. Everything that happened after 1776, the Jews are behind everything, so they can turn around and kill, blame the Jews and kill the Jews for everything. And that's the Lord's people is the Jewish, the house of Israel, Judah, where the Jews uh, 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 derive from. Okay, here's the definition of crypto-Jew. It says crypto-Jew. The term crypto-Jew is also used to describe the descendants of the Jews who still generally secretly maintain some Jewish traditions, often while adhering 
often while adhering to other faiths, most commonly Catholicism. And here you see, uh, here the big word is secretly. It's called a crypto Jew who's secretly adhering to Roman Catholicism, basically to Rome's uh, doctrine. So here we see this is the Illuminati plan to get the Jews all persecuted because they're actually, the Jews that are really running the show are actually working for Rome. This is uh, Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. And uh, this, is, this is a picture that, that uh, was photographed May 8, 1945, showing the destruction of, of uh, Berlin and uh, Nazi Germany. This also became the Iron Wall, ran right through here. And uh, here you see the European Union coin. And this is actually a 50 cent uh, coin, European Union coin. And look, they have the same depiction of, of uh, the Roman uh, Empire. As you see, here's the four horsemen, like the four apocalypse of Revelations. You got like the white horse, uh, you got the, the red horse, the pale horse, and the black horse. It's interesting, they got the four horsemen. And up on top, they have the symbol of Baal with the Roman eagle up on top. It's all interesting how when you understand symbolism you can see all this. But it's interesting how they, they minted a coin right here uh, uh, depicting uh, this, this is actually the symbol of division and reunification. And so here you see it was destroyed at one time and now they're going to re, uh, reunify Europe, the European Union, and build up, build up the Fourth Reich, which the First, Second, Third Reich continue to try to build up this New World Order now we're entering into the Fourth Reich under the New World Order of, of the uh, Roman Babylon Empire. This is another good book called Rulers of Evil about uh, Tupper Saucy. Anyway, he goes on to explain how uh, the, the Jesuits were really into, into uh, theater and entertainment because they wanted the Catholic, uh, the Protestants to get away from their Bible. In order to get away from their Bible reading and studying the scriptures all the time, they invented theater, and they they they, they uh, brought in Shakespeare and uh, other diversionaries to keep us from studying the, the Bible in, in, in school. And so now uh, they have they realize that the people love entertainment, and so the Jesuits have always been into entertainment. And so basically, uh, they have used entertainment to get us away from our Bible studies and school. And now we study Shakespeare instead. And he also goes on to explain how the, uh, uh, yeah, before the United States Constitution was uh, formed, uh, the colonies uh, under their Constitution, uh, if you were a Catholic, you could not vote or hold office, which is really important. And so uh, that was one of the reasons the Jesuits have worked uh, to uh, help bring in the uh, the Constitution is a secret back door, but it's all into this book right here, The Rulers of Evil. The Catholic Church and the Jesuits have been out here for 300 years before Brigham Young and the Mormons came out here to Utah. And as you see here, they have they found gold with the Babylonian iron uh, sun cross of Baal on them. And also, if you study the Uenas, and uh, the mines around here, you find out that the Jesuits have used the Indians and the Mexicans as slave to ore their gold out of, out of America. And when the king of Spain, Carlos, the king of Spain, found out that the Jesuits were still in the gold, then he had those Jesuits uh, killed down in Mexico as the ones he could catch. And the rest of them fled out with their ships to Spain loaded with gold. And so for 300 years, you can see the history of uh, that period of time that the, the Jesuits uh, were in this area long before Brigham Young and the Mormons came out. On page 64 of this book, when King Carlos rounded up the Jesuits to, uh, to uh, get rid of them, uh, they shut down... Uh, they forced closings of 133 missions, 24 colleges, 11 seminaries, plus large number of Indian schools. The Jesuits have always been into education, and you can see that they had a stronghold of education out here uh, way back in the uh, 1500s 
and 1600s on forward about educating the populace. And if you educate the population, you can control the way they think. Now we're going to fast forward it up till today, January 2007. The U.S. Catholic School enrollment update. Look, there is 8,000 Catholic schools in America, 6,785 6, elementary, 1,215 secondary schools, and there's 47 new schools that have opened. Uh, what other religious group? It's not the Jews. It's not any other group of, of uh, uh, entities that has opened it, this many schools and yet uh, it's amazing that uh, if you study the history of Catholics through the Middle Ages all the way up through till today, you'll see that the Catholics have always been in charge of your school systems. And uh, here's a news article, uh, March 26, 2007, the ADL Vatican Jewish Relations. And here you see the director of the ADL receiving the highest award of uh, it's called the Papal Knighthood, the Papal Knight of the Order of St. Gregory. It's the highest church honor that the director of the ADL has received. Most people believe the Jews are behind everything, but here shows that the Catholic Church has given the director of the ADL uh, the highest award that any person could get called the Papal Knighthood. And remember, knight knighthood represents ancient Rome, the membership of ancient Rome, Babylon. This is Nancy Pelosi, the new House Speaker of Congress, and here she is standing with a top Jesuit priest. And so more and more, if you pay attention, you can see these Jesuit priests standing with the members of Congress. Mitt Romney is listing potential running mates, and he, would, he, he chooses Catholic Jeb Bush, and this is what he said about Catholic Jeb Bush. I love him. If his name weren't Bush, he'd be running for president. I am convinced, says Romney. More proof that the Roman Catholic Church is Babylon. The Roman Catholic Cardinal fall, falls blessing Easter bas baskets. The AP article, April 8, 2007. Uh, he slipped and fell on the marble floor of a church while blessing Easter baskets. Remember Istor, the Queen of Babylon? And here we have the Roman Catholic Church blessing Istor, which is the Queen of Babylon. There's your another connection right there. This is dated uh, March 24, 2007. Marked the 50th anniversary of signing of the Treaty of Rome, a major step towards the creation of today's European Union. And look who's given the address. The pontiff, Pope, told the bishops in Rome for the ceremonies that they're here celebrating the Roman Empire. It's the same connections that's happened all the way out through the ages where the pontiff and the kings of Europe and now the kings of the world are all joining hands in this great new Babylonian New World Order. This article is out of the UK, dated January 21st, 2007. Saddam's lieutenant pleads to Pope for mercy. Aziz, that's him right here, the former deputy prime minister of Iraq, has thrown himself on the mercy of the Pope in an attempt to secure his release from the U.S. custody. And here you see that what's very interesting is he's a 70-year-old Catholic. Isn't this very interesting? And as you read on in the article, look at this. Aziz is a Chaldean Catholic from a Babylonian branch of the church, which made full ties with Rome. Isn't that interesting that he's a Chaldean Catholic, and we know that the crypto-Jew is another branch of full ties with Rome, so we see these different, uh, or, uh, different uh, races of people that call themselves by different names that are in full ties with Rome. So everything is one big Babylonian uh, New World Order system. This is dated September 24, 2006. The headline is, Europe blasted for not defending the Pope. The President of the European Commission has expressed disappointment that Europe, European leaders have failed to defend the Pope Benedict over his recent remarks about Islam. And he goes on, we must defend our values. See, it's interesting how the, uh, the kings of Europe are defending the Pope 
like they've done in the past, and you see it now it's in the future or, or today's uh, time frame. Here's an Associated Press uh, article, November 5th, 2006, the first Catholic cathedral in the U.S. reopens. It goes on, Baltimore, the first Roman Catholic cathedral in the United States, reopened to the public Saturday at $34 million restoration. The St. Peter's is to the, uni is to the universal church, the Baltimore Basilica, say the Universal Church, a worldwide symbol of religious freedom. And it, uh, it goes on to say here that the 200-year-old cathedral came to symbolize the acceptance of Catholicism in the fledging, fledging United States. So here they're talking about the acceptance that the church has now has received, but at a period of time it was not received. So now it's a universal church of all religions called Babylon. You see books like this all the time, Historic America, the Southwest. And on the front cover, you can't help but the Catholic missions. And if you look at the Western shows, they're all over the place. And people got to understand that these Jesuits are like insects. The Catholic church is everywhere to open up schools, to indoctrinate the Indians, to indoctrinate the Mexicans. That's why they call it Latin America, folks, because that's where it came from, is Latin. And Latin, the only language that is, that is officially Latin, if you look it up in your encyclopedia, is the Vatican. It's the only place that has Latin as the official language of their state. Anyway, it's all interesting when you connect the dots. Here's another old photograph right here of the Jesuits a school system and their mission training and are indoctrinating the people of the Indian race and the Mexican race and uh, there's just another uh, old uh, uh, building there of a mission. Of course this is the famous Alamo in San Antonio, Texas and uh, a lot of people don't understand that this was a Catholic mission and so here again we have these uh, symbolic uh, buildings that have historical background that's a Catholic mission and a, and a school system. Out of this same book on page 71, in 1823 Austin established San Filippi de Austin to serve as the colonial capital of Texas. As an American settler is poured into Texas, they set up their own communities, quickly outnumbering Hispanic settlers. Most refuse to become Mexican citizens, convert to Roman Catholicism, or learn Spanish, all of which had been conditions accepted by Austin. So here, in order to become a Mexican citizen, you had to convert, convert to Roman Catholicism. So if you're a Protestant, there's absolutely no way you can, w would convert to a Roman. So you see the stronghold people that, how many people know this? that in order to become a Mexican citizen, you had to give up your, your, uh, your Christian beliefs uh, uh, as a Protestant and become a Roman, uh, be part of the Roman Catholicism and, and learn Spanish. It sounds like today, doesn't it, and learn Spanish? Try to go down to Mexico and try to tell them to learn English. Yeah, this news article is September 21st, 2006, World Net Daily. The Iranian president uh, has uh, talks to the United Nations and he reveals an ap apocalyptic view. And listen to what the Iranian president said, that a messianic figure is posed to reveal himself after an apocalyptic holocaust on the earth that leaves most of the world's population dead. Here he is, he's saying that a, Masonic, a messianic figure is posed to reveal himself after World War III. And right after he gave this speech at the UN, he went over to the Council of Foreign Relations building in New York and spent 90 minutes with the CFR in meetings. Now, uh, this is very revealing that they're all in bed together. Of course, the UN chief in his last speech has global war over religion. You see how it's all over religion? This is an interesting article out of Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia online. Type in Prophecy of the Popes. And here you read the prophecy of the popes attributed to St. Malky. And, and he lists 112 short phrases in Latin, the next 112 popes from the time he had these 
a trance, as he went into a trance, and he had these revelations. And as you look and see, uh, flip the page, you see here, uh, he has the different popes, 167, 68, and here he has Latin, and here it is in English. And you can see, as you flip through, all of the different revelations he had, all the way up to the very last pope. And we're going to get to it here in a second. There's quite a few. And right here, on this side here, you got the 111th pope. And here it is in, French, in Latin. And here is Benedict. And so basically, he was correct on all his prophecies from the 110th, as you see up here, as the 110th Pope, John Paul II, and then he reveals that Benedict would be the 111th. And now he only says there's one more after this, and this is the 112th uh, Pope. And this Pope is going to be called Pope Peter. And it says the Holy Roman Church will be occupied by Peter the Roman. And so, like, they, they say that Peter was the first pope, and it will end. The first shall be last, and last shall be first, and that the next pope will be called Peter. Now we're going to speculate and find out who I believe is going to be the next pope. And this is the guy that is the personal secretary of the pope right now. His name is Don George Gangswine. And I'll get into more of that. This is who I believe the last pope will be, is, is Don George Gangswine, and he is the private secretary of the current pope, Pope Benedict, and Pope Benedict was the pri private secretary of the previous pope. And so here we see the chain of command. Now, they keep this individual completely out of the spotlight, but you, could do, you do can see a few uh, pictures and stuff on the Internet if you look him up. Here is one of the few pictures you can find online. This is George Gangswine, and there's the Pope. And we're going to read a little article right here of what the Guardian has to say about him. This is reported on Tuesday, August 23, 2005. And it says right here that George Gangswine is the poster boy of Catholic conservatism. The, the, the Italian press compares him to what? George Clooney. And we'll get a nice little shot of that so you can see it. See? The Italian press compares him to George Clooney. And who else? And Hugh Grant. Here he is, the poster boy of Catholic conservatism. And here he is, up here, is the poster boy of what I believe is the final and last pope called Pope Peter. And in the same article, listen to what the one German magazine remarked. We women held our breath. And it, and it goes on, shame that he is taboo for us women. Well, when you have all the looks of George Clooney and Hugh Grant, you're going to get a huge following of the women. The article goes on and says that he's a doctor of canon law. He's gotten his Ph.D. degree. Same article goes on to say that he understands complicated issues within about 10 seconds and can give a clear and immediate answer. He's very eloquent and can be very charming. So not only does he have very, uh, that he can solve complicated issues within 10 seconds, but he's very eloquent and be, can be very charming, exactly what the world would love to see in a leader. Again, this article is titled, Thou shall not drool, and it's August 23, 2005, The Guardian, and uh, this is where you can find this article I just read to you. This is really big news. This is concerning the black pope, Peter Hans Kovenbach. We'll take a nice close look at him. He's the current general of the Jesuits, the most powerful man in the world, and look what this says here in the Catholic news press says the Jesuits to elect new black pope in 2008. It would begin on January 5th, 2008 in Rome. Each of the 91 provinces in the world will hold a provincial congregation by March 1st, 2007 to prepare for the Rome's gathering. And then he's going to be prepared to step down in 2008, so we need to, to keep a close eye on who the new, new general is going to be. 
This is out of the same article. It says, Kovenbach is never seen without his black, you read over here, cassock. So he's always wearing black. And here's the website you can find it at catholicnews.com. He's been the general since 1983, and it's unlike generals that they, uh, they, they always die in office. That's when they're replaced. So this is a, a monumental event that, that's going to happen. And so why are they going to put a new black into office in 2008? Because I believe they have something big planned for us coming here uh, in 2008 or soon after. The Illuminati Jesuits want you to blame the Jews for everything. And the Lord knew this, and that's why it says in Scripture, the opposite is true, Isaiah 5, verse 20 says the opposite is true. The Jesuit military uses Jews as a cover known as crypto Jews. And in Revelation chapter 2 verse 9, quote, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are the Jews and are not, but are the synagogue church of Satan. The Jews did not have the power to kill Christ. The Jews had to go to Rome, i.e. Pilate, and nothing has changed. So See, the Jews, they didn't have the power to kill Christ, and so they had to go to Pilate, i.e. Rome, because Rome has the power to kill and to punish their government. And right here, Daniel confirms that nothing will change. Daniel chapter 2, verse 37 through 44, because he saw this Roman Empire will rule until Christ's kingdom comes and destroys it. So nothing has changed throughout history as far as the power structure, and when we need permission, we have to go to Rome to attack one country or the next, just like the Jews had to go to Rome to kill Christ. Nothing has changed, just like Daniel says. And in the article, it goes on to says, it says, Rome hides behind the cloth of the church and has always killed the Jews and uses them as bait. The Jesuits of the short robe take on Jewish names as a cover and or the Jews who swore an allegiance to Rome are called crypto-Jews. So everyone will be blamed on everything on them so they can turn around and kill the real Jews. And it says here, it's called the Hegelian dialectic process. Create the crisis, control both sides, then offer the solution, order out of chaos. Rome is hiding behind the synagogue church in disguise and their goal is to round up all the real Jews and blame them for everything and kill them all so the Lord will have none of his people to come home to. Also, Rome's goal is to blame the Esau Arabs for everything. For example, 9-11, to kill them all. Both Jews and Arabs will want peace so they will clamor uh, to have the Roman Pope to sit in the Temple Mount. So here we got the three groups of people that always wanted to control Israel, or uh, Jerusalem. It's always been the Jews and the Arabs, that's what you see on the news all the time, these two factions fighting over the Temple Mount. But what's hiding in the wings is, is the uh, Roman church. Remember, they controlled that part of the world, the Temple Mount, for about 180 years, and then they were ran out by the Arabs. But here, the Jesuits are having the Jews and the Arabs fight among each other so they can't stand each other and they want peace. And who are they going to go to for peace is the third party, the Roman Pope. And this is what's going to happen in the future to who's going to be able to occupy Solomon's rebuilt temple. Nothing has changed throughout history that these three groups all wanted to control Jerusalem. It's called the Hegelian dialectic process. Rome will come out on top for a period of three and a half years. Then the Lord will wreck Rome's plan and finally destroy the Holy Roman Empire called the Fourth Reich. You need to study the history of the Dark Middle Ages to connect these dots. When Rome captured Jerusalem in the Middle Ages, they liked to put their sun symbol of Baal on top of the Dome of the Rock and here to occupy the holy site of Solomon's temple. And thus they have the sun symbol, which represents sun day. And when Islam, the Arabs, kicked out the, uh, the Catholic uh, control of uh, the Temple Mount, they put up their insignia 
it's the representation of the moon. Thus we have moon day, Monday, moon day. So we have Sunday with the cross, Sunday, and then we have moon day. And so it's a battle over uh, the, the Baal worship of uh, Monday, uh, Tuesday. They're all representation of the different uh, pagan uh, uh, astrology uh, planets and that every day of the week. It all goes back to Babylon. Okay, four things are going to come out of World War III. These four, th four kingdoms will be destroyed. First kingdom is going to be USA and America. They're going to be one entity destroyed. And then you got the Middle East and Arabs is on the hit list of destruction. Then the Temple Mount is going to be destroyed, and, and the true followers of Israel will, will go into, into the Petras like they did in the Old Testaments to flee from the wickedness. And then you also, uh, the Vatican is going to be destroyed. Now the people of the world will, will feel badly for the Vatican is, is completely destroyed. And so the world will also clamor that the Vatican's purpose is to move to Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, and build, rebuild Solomon's temple. And, uh, and then so the Pope is going to have the Arabs and Israel fight. And then out of this Hegelian dialectic will come the Vatican third party, which these two will clamor to sit in the, in the rebuilt Solomon's temple. And here we're going to have the New World Order. It's going to be the headquarters. The New Jerusalem is going to be the headquarters of the New World Order, the Jesuit New World Order. I thought this was a good cartoon out of the newspaper, September 25th, 2006. Let me quote an ancient text to judge not that ye be not judged. And this is Pope Benedict here over the critical comments of Islam because they want to start this war on religions, World War III. And it's interesting, this cartoonist had the Spanish Inquisition and he has his eyes closed, the Pope, and then it has the Holocaust in action. And here you have the Pope's ears uh, being closed off. And then you have the uh, fedophilia science, uh, silence. And here you have uh, what's going on in the church with his mouth covered. And here you see the atrocities throughout the ages as a continuation of what's going on now. And this was in the Daily Herald, Monday, September 25th, 2006. This is kind of a funny cartoon because 99% of the people are like these people right here. And uh, this guy is warning the end is being completely ignored. Here's another cartoon. Here's the Pope adding gasoline to Islam bigotry and it's funny you know adding fuel and so you can see here he is at the bell cross and he's adding gasoline and here we have cartoons telling us what's going on. I want to take you through this book I picked up called Washington from the Air. Let's take a look at Washington DC. This is out of White Star, White Star Publishers. It's one of the first pictures they have on their, in their book. This is the, uh, the obelisk called Washington Monument. This is a symbol of Babylon, or Nimrod. That's why it has the rod, Nimrod. It's the male phallus. This is a symbol of Baal, the sun god. You have to go back and read the, the transcripts uh, of ancient Babylon, where you had Queen Semiramis, and she was impregnated by Nimrod, and that's why they have this symbol here. It's a Babylonian symbol. How Christian is this? This is going across the bridges into Washington, D.C., here they have the Greek idols here, all in nude. How would you like to have your children in that see this as they're entering into Washington, D.C.? Obviously, Satan likes to incorporate each one of the kingdoms uh, into one, uh, the Greek kingdom into the Roman Empire kingdom, and so they incorporate all these old New World Order kingdoms into the next New World Order kingdom up. That's why you have all these symbolisms of, uh, of paganism and nudity, and Easter with fertility, with the eggs and the rabbits, and everything like that. What kind of message is this sending to your children? And here on page 24, it says, uh, White temples of Greek and Roman. Where is the temple of God? It's always these uh, pagan uh, religious temples that they build there in Washington, D.C. This is a symbol. This is the Washington Capitol right here. This is a, a drawing in 1874, and look at here, here's the Bohemian Owl. There's the eyes, there's the body of the owl, and he's standing on top of the Pyramid Roads, which we'll show you another picture of. But there's the White House and the body of the owl of Bohemian. 
Here's a photograph on page 43, and here you see the Bohemian Owl. There's the eyes, there's the capital, there's the body, and there's the pyramid road that this Bohemian Owl is standing on. This picture was taken in 1939, 1939 picture, and there's the White House and the Bohemian Owl and the, and the Pyramid Road. Here in the book, page 76, here you see the emblems of the naked man and woman on the horseback crossing the bridge into Washington. And over here it looks like horses with wings on both sides, which is both the pagan Greek Roman idols. And here's another view right there. And there is a back view of those horsemen. And here you see the bridges leading into Washington, D.C., and there's those Greek idols. And here the, here's those horses with wings going into the bridges going across. Then you know you're entering into Babylon. Let's see, what, let's see the churches they have in this book. This one is St. Peter's uh, Cathedral right here. This one here is, is the Church of St. Peter's is the shortest walk from Capitol, Capitol Hill of the Church of Rome. Anyway, they all meet in here, go to the confessional booths, and then they get their orders behind closed doors. How convenient disguise. Here's another photograph of a church. Lo and behold, it's a Catholic shrine again. And here you see it right there. And we flip it over to this, and there's a close-up. Looks like the Dome of the Rock, doesn't it? And again, look what we got here, the National Cathedral. Took 90 years to build. There's the center place of Babylon. And in between the Catholic churches in Washington, what do we got? The Roman Colosseum. Well, we got to keep the people entertained through theater and other means to keep them distracted off God's Word, the Bible. And here we have the different Catholics and Protestants all worshiping the games like they did back in Rome when Rome was on fire and nobody paid attention until it was all destroyed. Oh, and besides the churches, look what else we got. We got a college at, uh, in Washington, D.C. called Georgetown University. It's a Jesuit-run and operated college. How convenient that Bill Clinton went there and was chained by, trained by the Jesuits. This kind of sounds like the Vatican. Listen to this. Georgetown is a small city within a larger city. It's like the Vatican is a small city within Rome. Boy, this is really nice. This is Georgetown's fame. Includes a, a rather dark attraction. The film The Exorcist was filmed here at Georgetown University. Some say that Jesuit uh, Georgetown University, which is uh, the oldest university in uh, the Jesuit-controlled university in, in America, and here it says, here it says, founded in 1789, Georgetown University is the oldest Catholic university in the United States. It has been run by the Jesuits since 1805. So now you know I'm not making this stuff up. It's all run by the Jesuits, where Bill Clinton went to school. There's a photograph of the old quad, the old part of Jesuit University right there is added on. So there you have it, Washington from the air. So now you see that there's hardly any mention or there's no mention of any Protestants at all in Washington, D.C., but it's all about Catholic churches and Catholic schools. Anyway, isn't that very interesting? Hello, my name is Dave Cleveland. I'm the one that's been running things behind the scene. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you make copies and spread the word out. May God bless you. Thank you.